Everybody take your seat, please. Thank you. One is agenda items. That's the first one. And that's the budget tonight. Okay. And then the second one is, is just for general, non-related to the budget. Okay, before we start, well, budget related, you this is a budget that. meeting, and there's going to be two public sessions. Out of a courtesy for the people, the first public session will be about the budget. So if you have comments about the budget, I think there's a list for yes. the people that are going to speak about the budget. That's correct. Then after we vote on the budget, it's open to the public, then there's a list about people that want to speak about things other than the budget, right? That's correct. Okay. How many people do we have for the budget? 26. Thank you. How many people do we have for other things? 24. Okay. So far. In that case, I'm going to ask that we make it three minutes for each person speaking, so that way it'll bring us into th only three the hours. So for the public session, it'll be three minutes instead of five minutes. So we'll have about 30 speakers for the budget, about 30 speakers otherwise, and we'll be having a, thir a three minute time limit. Okay. Gary, would like to do Okay. Do you want to please open the meeting? This meeting is being held in conformity of the Open Public Meeting Act. Proper public notices of this meeting was published in the local papers on April 27th, 29th, May 1st, 3rd, and 4th, 2014. If any board member or member of the public in attendance believes that the meeting is in violation of the Open Public Meeting Act, the Hoboken Board of Education requests that they make a statement at this time. The board wishes to make those in attendance aware that this meeting is being recorded on video and will be broadcast by the board at a later date on cable TV channel 77 and Fios uh, channel 46. The Hoboken Board of Education is committed to preserving the decorum of the public process and is mindful that we live in electronic age of computers, cell phones, and other electronic communication devices. Nevertheless, we respectfully request that all meeting participants kindly silence their electronic devices during the course of the meeting, and if use of that device is necessary, we ask that you please leave the meeting room and conduct uh, personal business. If you could please rise for the salute of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please. Mr. Biancamano. Present. Ms. Evans. Here. Mr. Klepfel. Here. Ms. McAllister. Here. Ms. Mitchell. Here. Mrs. Rhodes Kearns. Present. Ms. Sobolov. Here. Ms. Stromwall. Here. And Dr. Gold. Here. Okay. That's it. We'll start with the um, superintendent's budget presentation. Okay. So normally we have about a dozen people attending our board meetings, and obviously we have many more tonight. Um, in many ways, I'm, I'm actually very glad that so many people are able to come out to the board meeting tonight because it is very important to understand the school district budget. It's very important to understand how the budget works, how it affects the traditional public schools, the students that attend those schools, and also how it affects charter schools. Many of you are here from um, one of the charter schools, and so I think it's a, it's a very good thing for you to understand just how our budget works. Um, so, this year we've been tasked with an extraordinary, extraordinary budget challenge. The ongoing effort to push costs for public education away from the state and federal government and more to the local level continues. Combined with a number of ongoing issues, we are left with a very difficult budget situation. The original version of our budget showed there was a large gap between our revenue and our anticipated expenditures. And after many months of discussion, deliberation, consideration of all different possible possibilities, the budget we have is still not what we would like it to be. And I think that is one thing we can all agree to. The causes of the budget gap are the result of a number of forces coming together, as we said before, to create a perfect storm that will likely deepen and continue for the next few years. There are six primary reasons that make it reasonable on our part to believe that the difficult budget situation we have this year will continue for at least the next three to five years. So the first thing to understand 
is, as I said in the beginning, the issue with state aid and the state continuously contributing less towards public education, not only here, but also in other school districts throughout the state. The state increase for this district is a little under $50,000. So recall that I've reported to the board that the state's lawful funding formula was not followed this year. And as a result, the Education Law Center took action on behalf of school districts across the state and we received revised state aid funding notices. The revised notice does not change our financial situation, but it does show that we are underfunded. The district is underfunded by about $2.3 million. This means that the state has determined, based on the mix of students we have, and our enrollment numbers, and the cost to educate each one of those students, the budget for the district should be $2,300,000 higher, and that only takes us to what they consider to be the bare minimum level of funding called adequacy funding. As you know, our state budget is a disaster. And that situation is unlikely to change anytime soon. So the state aid situation will not likely improve. And I, as I said, that will probably continue for a number of years. We have something that some of you are familiar with. We have a food service deficit. The food service deficit will need to be addressed every year to the tune of at least $200,000 over five years. That will be a million dollars that we need in, in, in the budget to address our food service deficit. And that's something that has a long history. We've discussed many times but it's something that we need to be concerned about as that issue is not going away. The ongoing issue of budgeting unreserved surplus as revenue into the next year budget at the current level of approximately $1,600,000 will need to be reduced significantly as we look to the future. So to make a long story short, the Board of Ed for many years has taken our surplus and used the surplus as a revenue source in the following year budget. So what does that do for you as taxpayers? It takes the tax levy down by $1.6 million every year. So the taxes have been reduced by the board by budgeting our surplus in the amount of about $1.6 million over the past many years. And that has assisted the tax levy and it's kept it lower than what it would have been otherwise. Now that we have a situation that's a little different, we can't achieve this without raising taxes or reducing expenditures, it's one or the other. Recall that the auditor for our board members has addressed the issue with the Board of Ed and you, at this point we really have no choice but to take action and work on that issue. Also recall that there is a situation we cannot anticipate any ability to generate that kind of surplus in the future. So that also hinders our ability to give money back as time goes by, thereby creating a bunch of other pressures on our budget. The OLA expansion was approved and as a result there is a total charter school allocation increase of about $780,000, somewhere in that range. So basically is a good estimate. We're estimating that this year, as well as in the following two years, we're going to have to increase the budget by $750,000 to continue with the charter school allocation. Um, it's important to note that OLA is one of three charter schools. So it's, a, it's an increase for all of the charter schools. Um, in our case, just the charter increase alone, so this is kind of a crazy situation, the charter increase alone eats up the 2% cap. The 2% cap we have is about $750,000. And what that does is if we, if we go to cap, if the Board of Ed goes to cap, it leaves nothing in terms of revenue from the local tax levy for our traditional public schools. So although we've developed increased spending authority that we're able to use with this budget called bank cap, we are not going to be able to generate that due to prior, we were able to generate that because we spent in prior years below the cap. We had three years where there was a 0% tax levy increase, so we have something called bank cap. That is a legal way for the Board of Ed to raise the budget beyond the 2% tax levy limit. So that's another factor in our budget, but something that will be reduced in the coming years. The other issue we face is that the Department of Ed overextended itself with school choice funding at a level that was beyond what the state could ever afford. While very popular for a few years, and it spread like wildfire to districts throughout the state, the idea of school choice is expensive, and the state is now dealing with a lack of funding to continue the program, as well as potential court cases from some of the choice districts. As a result, the Department of Ed continues to make an effort to reduce school choice aid. So this is a revenue hit for us. This year, the reduction is approximately 255,000. So the good news is over the past few years, we have dramatically increased our school choice numbers, and that has led us to have a school choice allocation for our district of about $2.8 million. So it's a huge source of revenue for the district, but that will probably be decreased over the next few years, further complicating our revenue picture down the road. 
Um, but again, the good news is that we jumped on board when we did, because as a result, we have the source of revenue that we would not otherwise have, and we would not have if we started to try to increase school choice numbers today. That would just not be possible. And um, the other factor is that the federal government continues to reduce education spending, and as a result, we've been notified that we must budget, anticipating about 15% reduction in federal revenue for our budget. So keep in mind that this is at the same time when there is unprecedented change that is required in all, all public school districts, largely due to federal requirements. The end result is an unfunded mandate in, the, in terms of the Common Core, and also with the changes to the teacher and principal evaluation system, both very costly undertakings in terms of staffing, in terms of professional development, a lot of training is required, and there's a lack of funding for that. So unfortunately, we are in a difficult budget cycle for this year. And what I'd like to do is I would like to turn things over to Mr. Moffitt, who is going to take you through the ins and outs of our budget. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is the uh, third of of about three meetings we've had, uh, public meetings, uh, to discuss the budget. Uh, we welcome you all, uh, those that have not been here uh, before. Some of what you will see tonight I've talked about uh, in January or March. Uh, so for those who have attended the meetings, it'll be a little repetitive, but I wanted to give you a flavor of the overall budget cycle, what we're concerned about, uh, not only from what the superintendent has said as far as the quandary that we, we find ourselves today, uh, but also what our current uh, budget looks like. So uh, I'm going to start out with a little bit of an overview and then we'll dive into some of the details. That's a quick overview. I'm going to, like I said, uh, go over the, some of the lead-in as far as micro, meaning uh, small, uh, small goals and some larger goals. So we'll start off with the macro side. Um, Part of the process uh, starts immediately when the uh, school year starts. Basically, July starts uh, the budget review preparation stages. We look at how uh, our salaries are, are starting off. We have 12-month employees that start in July. We have a, a group of 10-month uh, employees that start in September, so we're watching it. But as we start uh, creating the budget and looking at these numbers, I, I keep attuned, as well as a lot of the other administrators, about what the chatter, what I call the chatter uh, from Trenton is. Uh, meaning, uh, are we hearing uh, revenue shortfalls? Uh, are we hearing departments are cutting back? Are we hearing um, major issues from the federal government, like sequestration that happened last year, uh, or any type of uh, funding issues they may have with, say, uh, no child left behind? So those are things that we're looking at. We're looking at the politics of that. We're looking at if there are any authorities or uh, other departments that are uh, cutting back. Uh, the state may be looking for areas to save because that usually is a good indication that the state of New Jersey is looking for monies and ways to save, which ultimately means that I'll probably, as Hoboken Public Schools, receive less as uh, state aid, either restricted or unrestricted aid. We also start looking at our, our basically our spending patterns, uh, not only historically, but also as we start off the school year, we see where uh, for example, our energy costs are. Uh, we look at uh, other areas like special education. Uh, sometimes you'll see a, a trend continue on, so we start looking at the general picture. Uh, again, upward trends, we look not only for uh, where they are going or leading us to, but we all ha also have to find uh, sources of potential budget funds to offset that increase within the budget. So we're looking at that, and that's a good indication of what we have to address in our budget for the following year. So we're, we're conscious of that. Um, and then um, we look to make sure that as we find the sources and uses of those funds, that we're not uh, negatively impacting any of the instructional areas that we uh, find uh, is our basic, our critical mission here uh, as a school system. So again, those are big macro issues that we look at, what I call the chatter. Uh, I also know when we go into a budget cycle uh, where we are as it relates to our, our uh, collective bargaining agreements. I know that we uh, have one that had already expired by the time we had started, and, and two that will be expiring at the end of this budget cycle, meaning 13-14. So as I build 14-15, I'm aware of that, so we start projecting potential increases in salary and benefits and run various different scenarios. <clears throat> We also look at some uh, enrollment issues as it relates to the deployment of our existing teachers to make sure we're covering all the uh, increases. Like for example, kindergarten tends to be an area where at the beginning of the school year not everyone's enrolled, but we'll watch that. 
So we'll, we'll capture that information and then try to adjust on the fly. Sometimes we have to hire a new teacher because we have large classrooms. Uh, so we'll need maybe one or two positions to add to the budget or at least shift resources at that point. But again, that is an area that um, will indicate an area that we have to focus on in the future budget, again, 14, 15. Uh, as I said already, we're also looking to maintain those existing programs that we have that we like. Uh, so those are things that we start isolating. And we continue to confirm our spending pattern, not only in that year, but also historically. So uh, again, that's all information that we start using. Some structural issues that you may be aware of, you may not be aware of. Hoboken Public Schools is a former Abbott district. We're about one of 30 districts statewide that has uh, uh, been part of a court uh, decision, meaning Supreme Court. The Education Law Center brought the state of New Jersey to, uh, to court related to inadequate funding of public education. As a result, uh, they had a series of Abbott decisions over time that required certain things happen in, in Hoboken Public Schools, one of which is school-based budgeting. We focus on schools, our own schools, and, uh, and we allocate resources and isolate resources that are specifically instructional related or school operation related. So it's, they're isolated in our budget. We also have a, um, a few mandated programs that we're required to offer the residents of Hoboken. Uh, so we have parent outreach activities after school programs, stu student field trips that we have to uh, offer. Again, these are all historical uh, legacies of being a whole school reform district or an Abbott district. Uh, we have also a preschool program that we're required to offer. Uh, that's unique to these 30 districts. Not every district offers uh, free pre-K. And uh, we also have the lovely distinction of having the state authorize or control all of our re rehabilitation um, and our repairs, our capital repairs and new buildings. If anything we wanted to uh, renovate, we have to go through a state agency, which is called today uh, School Development Authority. So if they don't agree, to expand or they don't like the project that we have, we do not proceed on it. We don't even have an option to bond for that project. So those are some structural issues that we deal with in Hoboken that's unique to us. Enrollment assumptions are, are pretty big. I focus on uh, the areas uh, K through 12. That's our meat and potatoes budget. Uh, it's part of our operating budget, which is also known as the general fund budget. So uh, this year we were able to get a demographic study uh, to support what we thought we were experiencing already, which was in enrollment growth at the lower grade levels. Uh, right now, I'm looking at about 73, uh, for, uh, 73 students increasing between one and five grades. Uh, overall, it's about 97, it's a 4% growth, but I have a slide coming up. Um, relatively flat in the middle grades, six and eight. Uh, increase of about 20 students at the high school, and we're looking at about four out of district placements. That's basically where we are. Again, that's the core of what I concern myself with most during the budget process because it is part of uh, what I need to do with capacity. Uh, what does that mean, Bill? Uh, you know, you get 41 students for a school district of size, uh, 41 students over various different grade levels. It could usually be absorbed by existing staff, but if there's an area where there's a larger cohort of people, or students, I should say, uh, then I may have to consider uh, making a recommendation to add a, add a um, uh, an FTE, obviously in consultation with the superintendent and other administrators, but it's a way that we can shift uh, to cover, we will, but that's something where we have to start having a conversation when this becomes clear to us. So again, it's about 97 um, students. Now, um, I'm also asked if time to time, like, well, why is this so important besides just capacity building? It's also, there's a conception that uh, this goes into the formula state of New Jersey but as you already heard from the superintendent, it's been quite a while since they've run the formula. So increases in our enrollment really have no impact because we've been relatively f uh, flat funded for a number of years. So as much as this is information, we give it to the state, since they don't run the formula, it does not impact our state aid to the degree that it should if, in fact, they would run the formulas. But again, they don't. Uh, enrollment is also, I'm concerned about my, again, it's my general budget. I look at enrollment outside that of our control, and uh, I make, at this point, I'm gonna tell you this is information I receive as part of what they call the state aid notification, uh, but I do a lot of uh, budget uh, prep for this. I, do, I make some projections on a cohort survival method where I look at all of what I know from the charter schools 
and I project out to see what they may come in at, and I wait for the state aid notice. This is basically right off the state aid notice from the state of New Jersey. Again, it's, it's calculated and given to us from the Department of Education, and that's how all that breaks out. Now, the other category I will tell you, there are three charter schools that are in Jersey City that we do send students to. It's Ethical Community, Beloved, and Mets. Those are the major two. There's only a few that go to there. Uh, obviously, not many, but, uh, and that's the change from year to year. And again, that's all off the state aid notice. I get this off the state aid notice as well. I make a prediction over time, but then this comes in around March, right after the state aid uh, budget discussion from the governor. Uh, again, it moves from 7.5 to 8.2, which is a substantial increase that I have to raise to transfer to the various charter schools. Again, it comes out of our budget. I'm, I'm concerned about it because it is something that we have to raise and transfer to charter schools. So that's the increase that I have to worry about. And as the superintendent already uh, stated, that was over the amount of the 2% of our tax levy from year to year. So I knew coming into this budget cycle that we were already uh, below zero. Uh, over time, this is the trend, again, historical information. That's where we've been and that's where we're headed. Uh, for, it, for the 14-15 budget, 8.2, and I will expect something similar in the next two years after this because there will be a continuation of an expansion at OLA, which uh, will probably contribute another 40 kids uh, year after year. So again, it's a, a long-term lookout, and uh, that's as far back as we go. There are, is some more information, but it's a significant growth um, to our budget. Now, school level, uh, once I start figuring out the box that we have as far as a budget. Um, I'm worried about maintaining, in this, case, in this scenario where we already know we're underwater, um, how, how do we maintain resources and assets at our own school systems, uh, our own schools, I should say. So when I sit down and I, I've met with the, um, with the various principals and related staff departments, um, but when I speak to principals, uh, we talk about these school level goals. Uh, so what, what are they? Uh, a couple that popped up during our conversation. Virtual um, high school was part of it. We have a, a gifted and talented program we want to maintain from John Hopkins. We had, um, a, of course, readiness for the park, which is big this year you hear in the news. Um, we want to make sure we're ready and we had the assets and the resources for that. And uh, the last one had to do with, and I'm going to cheat and look at my note, here, uh, yeah, the, the tech, we have a, a student uh, assessment program, too, we want to make sure we had. So those are programs that as we go through, we wanted to protect through the budget period. Special education, again, we met with the, the uh, director of special education, and these were some goals that we had to re review with, with that individual. Uh, it's not always about tuition, it, although that's a big part of what the budget is about, meaning that small, the small size budget of special education but they're also responsible for providing related services like evaluations, speech therapy, medical services, those things, uh, and any other supplier material that is required for their individual education plan. So those are things we, we look at. Uh, some goals that they had was um, we had a summer program we wanted to expand to address some needs as a result of IEPs. Uh, we wanted to consider expanding some classroom and resource centers at the elementary school as well as re return students to less uh, restrictive environments. So, those were all some priorities that we were doing. Um, technology goals, again, director of uh, technology we sat, uh, maintain his core mission. Uh, again, it's old, structural related. We want to make sure that, like Park, we're ready. We have the assets and the capacity to, um, to repair or uh, problem solve at the school level and the classroom level. So we want to make sure he had those capacities. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, acquiring various different devices, iPads, computers, and that we were getting uh, replacements online, which we had a long conversation about getting back to a, a cycle program, and, and we are this, in this budget. And we also had the luxury uh, and the good fortune of receiving some funding, about $800,000 from a Sandy Relief Grant, which we wanted to make sure that we were coordinated with and that uh, we wouldn't duplicate any efforts there. So that's some technology. Uh, as far as that cycle, we were able to work in the budget. Again, it's at a savings, we tried to fit it in. Uh, instead of acquiring $100,000 worth of equipment, meaning uh, devices, we were able to fit this in. It was a lease purchase, so we were able to save a little money. Again, over the longer time, you do pay interest, but 
uh, it, you could fit it into your budget a little bit better. So we were able to get that squared away uh, in the budget and uh, we're considering other uh, assets. Security, same thing, want to maintain our systems, expand it where possible, and expand our, um, our reach as it related to receiving grants. Uh, we've been successful in the past receiving about, I'll say, estimated $10,000 over time to support that effort. So we we're going to try to continue to try to find funds to help us with that. Facilities, again, this is, uh, no one wants to talk about facilities because it's in the wall. They don't want to, you know, they don't see it, so it's hard, but it's like the heat, it's the air condition, it's, uh, you know, fixing the floors, it's snaking out a drain. These are all the, the, really what I call the operating side of it. So we have to worry about that in, in this area. So on top of the custodial maintenance type area, which is repairs and uh, cleaning, we also uh, look to monitor our uh, vehicle fleet. Uh, repair that and maintain those as well. And uh, we are in the process of uh, pro uh, dealing with paperwork as it relates to FEMA. We are expecting some additional resources as it relates to FEMA. We want to make sure we maximize that and coordinate that as well. So that was all, uh, all items that we talked about. The other issue that came up, and uh, the superintendent alluded to it earlier, and uh, the, the board's been working on it for a number of years, was a, a, a budget, I'll say a reduction plan. Uh, we've been very successful in at least uh, identifying resources to use to address the deficit. We have a reserve built in in 13-14 budget that will help us not only uh, deal with our operational issues, we, we hope to hit zero this year and that's what we're striving for, but in the event we don't, we have a reserve and what we don't use in reserve, we're able to reduce that accumulated deficit. If not um, dramatically, we're going to also hopefully at the end of the year have some other resources that may be available to continue to reduce that. That's all part of a plan that we've been following. We want to continue on that path uh, and, and improve that situation. That was a lot, that was real quick, uh, cliff notes, whatever you want to call it, I guess on the internet it's a little bit different now. But um, it only, you look at the slide, you go, geez, Bill, you only raised it $112,000. That's, that's a lot of hard work you didn't see because we had to go back because we knew we had a, a budget gap of over about two and a half million dollars. So a lot of the work came into getting back into the box. So we had to reduce the budget uh, and address that in this area. So we were able to control it to match up our, to our revenue stream by, by going back and making some hard choices. We'll do that in a minute, but that's 111 right there. And again, uh, that's only an increase of 0.21 from year to year. It's a Herculean effort, if, if I do say so myself. How did we do that? What are some, what are some of the actions that we, we took over the, the, year, uh, the, the days and the months that we had to uh, consider all options and to get back into balance? We looked at textbooks. We originally were hoping to acquire $300,000 in textbooks, but with lease purchase, uh, we can save the district about two fifty. dollars uh, in the acquisition costs, so that was able to help us meet that 0.21% increase. The athletic budget was reduced. We were restructuring some stipends. Uh, we were able to save on some supplies and material and some game costs were, were uh, I guess, efficiencies, I'll use the term. We deferred, which is unfortunate again, uh, deferred a number of maintenance projects, so we had to defer the high school toilet renovations, Wallace and high school kitchen upgrades, as well as some window and shades that we wanted to, to uh, get squared away and, and uh, cycle out. Uh, we also had an operating budget for the facilities. We looked at some efficiencies there to reduce that by about 140. We had some other individual line item reductions in, in the areas of special education and insurance, so we were able to save about 300 there. And uh, we were also, uh, we had continued on a comprehensive staff restructuring plan, which is currently still being finalized. Uh, but that all helped us get to that $111,000, which basically closed that gap by about $2.6 million. That is a summary of everything you'll see at the budget. That's a top level. There's a lot of information that rolls up into this. I use. Um, I should say the district uses a computer software program to build the budget. Uh, this is the top of the pyramid, if you could like to say. So you see some savings. You would think, uh, and I don't want to. I want to point that out right now. That to go back to the school-based budget, that is a big component. So the first area you see 
uh, has to do with um, some relocation of instructional, um, um, we'll say resources, but you'll see the athletics and you'll see some uh, co-curricular, that was the big one there, uh, which went to our school-based budget. So it doesn't show here, but it goes to another area of the budget, and I'll get to that in a little while. Um, uh, beyond that, we had some uh, restructuring, we had some uh, vacancies as related to AIDS that were coordinated with the pre-K, pre so we were able to uh, remove those vacancies that was, they were basically non utilized positions. Uh, again, we had the uh, athletic budget move, basically is a flat growth, relatively small, and then uh, the co-curricular. We did increase the summer schools, as I said earlier, uh, we were looking at the, the, the pre, uh, I should say the special education, and uh, we were able to expand uh, those summer programs, both on a, uh, enrichment as well as a summer program. Um, a big increase uh, had to do with support services. It has uh, tuition. Again, uh, we had four. Uh, we're indi I've indicated earlier that we have about four uh, out-of-district placements that uh, we anticipate and related services, so that pushed that number. Uh, another one I'd like to point out would be the health services. We were able to, as I was saying earlier, we look at our, our spending patterns, and if there's something out of whack and things that we can save, uh, that's a perfect example we were able to identify Although it's not a lot of money, it looks as percentage-wise, but it's an area that we found. Um, OT, PT, uh, again, this is, uh, it was a shift between uh, speech. Uh, so we had some professional service contracts that we were able to uh, reallocate into the uh, extraordinary services. Again, it's all special ed related, so we were just able to shift that within the budget. Um, trying to think what are the other ones. Uh, we had uh, identified staff training. Again, it was something that we were able to isolate and put in a, a different line, and that's why you see that populated. And uh, some of the other savings really had to do with uh, just finding just general savings across the central services and administrative info technology. Um, again, this is all part of what I consider to be the general fund operating budget. Uh, this next slide, you'll see the top. Um, Current expenses, you have capital outlay. Those are the remaining capital projects that are in the budget. Uh, again, it, it does decline, and that, that's that significant uh, decrease I was talking about earlier about things that didn't make it in. Um, we have the transfer of funds to charter schools. Again, that's part of the general fund. And then the contribution of school-based budgets. So that's the $22 million number. That increased about 5.4. Again, Operating budget, general fund, it's supported by local property taxes, which is considered local tax levy. That's $52 million. Below that is uh, what they call restricted funds. Uh, the preschool education aid, that's something, again, is unique to Hoboken. That's there, it's 10 million. You have total state projects and federal projects. Um, you have about a million four. As the superintendent stated, we had guidance from the department to reduce that by 15%. And with some uh, carryover that was not available, we were about 16% reduction. And what we don't have uh, this year, we have our last uh, debt service payment made by the end of this fiscal, fiscal year, and you will not see it in the future. What's unique about that is there's a separate tax levy, a separate tax that we collected in the past to offset that so that we no longer need that as far as tax support. So again, that will, in theory, go back to you uh, as taxpayers. And uh, at the bottom there, it's $64 million. When you add the 52 plus the $12 million in special revenue, restricted funds brings you to $64 million, almost 65. This is just a little pie chart to just get a visual. Uh, as you see, the biggest component is the school-based budgets. The second largest is the charter school transfer. The school-based budget, just to break that out for you, is about a million dollars. Again, this is majority of, uh, I think over 600,000 has to do with um, the athletic budget, a portion coming back, and a portion of the co-curricular, co which had to do with our drama productions. So that came in. And uh, the rest of the increase would be contributed to uh, health benefits as well as salary increases. So again, it's about a million dollar increase. And again, that's all related to being a former Abbott district. Again, overview, athletic budget is moving, 
you have textbooks changed uh, from, a, from a pure acquisition to lease purchase. You had some aid positions moving, uh, special education summer programs, and school-based budget, rather than replicate it, try to keep moving. Uh, I'm asked this question quite often, and I've heard that legal bills are extraordinary in, in Hoboken. It doesn't seem that way when I look at the numbers. Uh, it, 210 in this budget is what we predict. And that's down significantly. It's, I think, 67% from 2011. And it's close to, I think, 20% from last year. Another question I get quite often is, what about administrative costs? We're under the regional limit by about $32. And these are calculated by the Department of Education. And there's three regions, say New Jersey, we're in the north. And that's our number, the 2035. And again, we're under that. This is a lease purchase application um, that we have in our budget. This is, uh, we had an energy audit, and as part of that energy audit, we went and did relamping and uh, other uh, electric upgrades to improve efficiencies. We have about a five-year obligation that's in the budget. That's uh, pr principal and interest. So 14, 15 is two, $209,000. So that, that's in the budget. That's an obligation that we have. Capital outlays, this is what's in the budget, that's $601,000. Um, the Demers boiler projects, grant toilet renovations, and then that payment I was telling you, this is just a principal's portion, and then some miscellaneous. I, I talked about this already, uh, that's a debt service that's retired, so in the past it was $273,000, and uh, zero this year. Pre-K program, again, it's about $10 million, something that you don't have to do if you're not at an Abbott district or a former Abbott district. Um, it is a great, I think, uh, educational service here in Hoboken, and that, that's the tune of $10 million that we have in addition to the tax levy that supports the $52 million. On top of that, we have this. NCLB federal program, again, it's a, something that we have very little control over. A lot of the budget is tied to approvals from the department. Um, not only in the No Child Left Behind area, which is about $800,000, but also in the IDEA area, which uh, addresses special ed needs of the district. Now, this is the part where, after we do all this, we got, we got down to $111,000. Question is, how do we pay for it? You know, what is, what is that answer, Bill? Like, it's great that you have the appropriations, how much we need, but how do we finance it? How do we fund it? And a couple board members had uh, asked me to put this together. Um, these are the common areas that you use to pay for it. Local taxes, again, your, t your property tax. We give a bill basically to the, the town or the city and they pay on a payment schedule, their taxes. Uh, Formula-based aid, again, that formula concept doesn't really apply, but it is state aid. And what type of state aid is for special education, extraordinary aid, uh, and school choice. Restricted aid, again, is pre, uh, preschool aid and non-public. I'll give you a little bit about non-public. Non-public is um, money that passes through our budget that we have very little control over in a sense that it gets directed right to a private school. So we just account for it and transfer that money to a parochial school within the city limits. Restricted aid, again, NCL, NCLB and IDA. So how did we pay for it? Uh, this is how we pay for it. Local tax levy is $39 million. We have some tuition, and I'll go over some of the increases a little bit later. Uh, you have the rent, miscellaneous re revenue, which is uh, uh, interest, refunds, those type of things. You have uh, state aid, unrestricted. Again, that's that formula aid that only went up about $45,000. Federal aid, uh, $179. Uh, which is unrestricted, so that means semi, which is related to special ed. Uh, paperwork as far as it relates to services rendered to students and uh, federal that so it would be impact aid which is also we qualify for because we have a housing development and it, as a federal housing development there's money attached to that to, that we would receive uh, so that's in there as well as that funded balance which is the prior year surplus so that is the million three pie chart just Related to that, so you can see local, local tax levy supports that $52 million over about 76%. State aid's about 21%. Here's the revenue, advertised revenue. You see 
local tax levy, it's actually, if you bring, break out, it's 3.9. Uh, you'll see a little drop off on our tuition. Uh, we, we've lost a few students over time. We continually try to uh, uh, advertise our, our program and, and work in a um, cooperative situation with other school systems that they'll send their children to us. But we're actually uh, getting to a point where we are, we're using our own seats. So there's a little bit of, it's a good news, bad news type story. But uh, that is dropping off a little bit. Um, our rents and royalty is just sp split out in, in our budget. But uh, you have rents and royalty that dropped as well as uh, unrestricted miscellaneous revenue. Um, big issue with the rents is uh, that's usually the income that we get from charging for use of our facilities from profit organizations. Um, so that moved and that only increased that group 3%. That's a breakout of our state aid, $10.7 uh, million. Uh, what I'd like to point out to you at this stage is extraordinary aid. That's a pretty big unknown. I don't know that number even this year. I'm still waiting for it. So it's one of these issues where uh, the state of New Jersey decides when they want to tell us, but it's at the end of the budget cycle, so I have to anticipate like two years in advance. So I'm still waiting for that number, but we're going to take the historical amount. So it's about $180,000. Um, and then those are the other classifications I think we already talked about. And a million three on the bottom. Again, that's how we get to the $52 million. Again, that's where your tax levy, your local taxes support. And again, the areas, like I, I said to you, school-based budgets, charter school allocations, and, and some of our central office expenditures. So that revenue piece, you see that million dollars. That just represents in 1314. It represents that uh, the Sandy aid and grant that we received from United Arab Emirates and some FEMA money. Um, you'll see that, and then you see a little transfer uh, to our pre-K that's related to special education costs associated with pre-K disabled. And on the bottom, you'll see that repayment of debt. It's blank because we don't have that anymore. That brings us to $64 million. Again, real quick, that's the overview. 3.9 growth on our tax levy. Fund balance decreased. Local revenue decreased. State aid barely moved. 0.5, just like I think a 0.41 or something. School choice down, extraordinary aid. Who knows when that, I'll find that out. That's the tax levy increase. Dollar wise is million four. Represents 3.9%. That's our tax levy over the past few years. You'll see the column of the 2%, uh, which is the 3.9 figure. We're a little over that, and that's really due to the utilization of the cap bank, which I'll get to, and uh, accommodations for growth of enrollment, student enrollment. No, I'm sorry, it's a little boring sometimes, but uh, if you have questions about when we break, feel free to ask. That's our minimum tax levy. That means we cannot re reduce the budget and reduce that tax levy, levy below that three, seven uh, million dollar number. That's our bank cap that we utilize this year. We have a remaining bank cap, and what, what that is is basically we had the taxing authority of more than we utilize in, in a particular budget year, so we were able to, under uh, NJDOE guidelines, we could, quote, bank it. So we banked it to be used in the future. So we still have about 700, uh, around $700,000, but eventually that will expire, because it's like a three-year period where it has to expire. So this, a big portion of this will be expiring next year. Again, it's, it's something that the board did not take advantage of because they were it, it, on a frugal side, so they didn't want to push taxes higher, but they did bank it for the future in the event we need it. And uh, it's a wise decision because we've needed it. Uh, state aid, that was the numbers that we were throwing around before. It's kind of duplicated. Our fund balance, which is pretty big, that again has gone into the future budget. Uh, it's something that eventually you eat away at it, eat away at it, and that's what we're starting to see. Uh, what we project this year is, uh, we, again, a million three going to the budget, and about 100,000 we hope to go to a maintenance reserve to start addressing some of our facilities because we've deferred so much over time. Uh, so that's a concern of the board supporting putting money away for those maintenance facility issues down the line, which will leave us about a million dollars in surplus at the end of the year. Again, surplus is something that we can, we can maintain. I think people call it rainy day fund, uh, but it's usually about 2%, and this is well under the 2%. If we utilize 2%, we're probably up about a million, four, million, five, uh, million, four, million, five, and that's something that we can, we're entitled to carry from year to year. 
Now, how does this impact your taxes? Uh, this is information based on a 2013 assessment. So we have an average assessed of $143,000 assessment. Again, it doesn't mean the value of your home, it just means what it is assessed as. Uh, so that is a push about $56.97. That's the average. Again, uh, there's been some back and forth in the community. I, I think um, it's under a revaluation re process. It's, it's preliminary information for 2014. Um, we did run some scenarios, but I, I prefer to give you this because it's something that we have historically. This stuff that uh, is currently available is only a preliminary numbers, um, but that is uh, the information in front of you, and that ranges from 120 to 200 thousand dollars assessed. What's next? Well, obviously a vote tonight, but uh, if it is approved, uh, we will be sending the finalized uh, budget over to the county office, Department of Education. Budget information that not only do I have today, like this presentation will be av made available on the website. We have a Q&A that was handed out. That'll be available on the website. We have a user-friendly budget that'll be available as well with some additional detail. Uh, since it's, uh, it was adopted, then it, that's all final, so we can post it. Uh, we, we send information once our tax levy is nailed down, we send it to the city and we, and we finalize it with the county office. Uh, and then we open our budgets usually end of May, beginning of June, so that district uh, schools and departments can start utilizing their budget for the future. Uh, and there, it is subject to change. Uh, we can change moving forward. Although our adopted budget will stay, we, we, we will make allocation adjustments along the line, transfer, budget transfer, and it can change over time. So that's where we are, and that's the next piece. And uh, that will really conclude my presentation. Um, I think what we're going to do... Actually, what I want to do is have the public speak about the budget, then the board members, we already looked at the budget, but if we need any clarification or questions, we will then address it. So since there'll be a three-minute time limit, I think what would be helpful is if you announce the person who's going to speak, then also announce who's next on deck, so uh, we can do this efficiently and still hear everybody talk. And... Um, Okay, sure. Before we start, I'd like to make everybody aware that we have different groups in the room. We have a large number of people who are very concerned about their jobs, and this is very, very serious to them. We have other groups of people that have other concerns, and that's why it's very important that we do separate, I believe, the budget from the other part of the um, meeting. So please um, be aware that people's lives are actually being discussed now. So I'd like to talk about the budget, and um, please, who's the first person? Aaron Baviva. Close. I apologize. I'll probably. Hi, my name is uh, Aaron Barrera. I live at. Also, oh, please speak oh, in the sorry. microphone. Sorry. I live at 1027 Park Avenue, and I have a question. And I have a comment, and I don't know if you're actually compelled to answer questions, but from a taxpayer's perspective, and we talked a lot about tonight the charter schools. Does it make a difference in terms of tax levies if that money goes to a charter school or stays within the Board of Education school? It's sort of dollar for dollar. That's my question. And we'll write the questions down and at the end uh, we'll okay. address that. And I think as a comment, um, looking at the presentation, it's a lot of talk about maintaining sort of where the district is today. And looking at the amount that the district spends per student and the performance in the state, which is in the fourth quartile, and spending is probably in the first quartile, you guys are not inspiring, at least me, that you can deliver on the promise of educating students in Hoboken. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Please. Um, this isn't a, a ball game. This is really very serious for you all and for you all, and please, a little decorum. Next person. Uh, Sir Fai Samara. Mm -hmm. um, good evening. I am a public school parent, two children in Wallace, actually. Um, a third grader who's thriving, reading and in math at two grades above her grade level. My question to the board is that I'm a little unclear about our per pupil cost for the average learner in the average classroom. 
um, excluding the costs for out of district expenses, transportation, and special needs. Thank you. Thank you. Next, um, please. We need to get this next person to speak. Sam Stoffel. Mr. Moffat, could, could you announce this, the one that's Could you there? announce the next person so also? So they know when to come up. So they will. Sam Stoffel, and the next individual would be, it looks like Haley Stoffel. And I guess, is that Sabrina altogether? Okay. 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 You, okay. you can just speak. Yeah. You. No? You speak. Ms. Stoffel, announce you yourself and where you live, please. Sure. Hi, we're the Stoffel family. We live at 340 Garden Street. Don't think of this. Just read it. Hello, or hola. I'm Sam. Please don't stop our school at sixth grade, because if you do, you are also stopping. You will also stop friendships. This is true because we are going to lose our conversations. And slowly but surely, our friendships will fade away. Also, if you shut down the school at sixth grade, we will go to different schools and our bilingual talents will go to waste. I hope you change your mind. Drop the lawsuit, por favor. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hallie Stoffel, and I came here today because I want you to drop the lawsuit. And not only that, but I will miss my teachers, and I'm sure my teachers will miss me too. Please drop the lawsuit. Thank you. Sit or stay, whichever you want. Hi, how is everybody? You're good. So I wrote down what I wanted to say because I have to admit that I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but as I was going about my day today, thinking about what I would say here tonight, it struck me that there were some clarifications that needed to be made because um, a lot of people are talking about a lot of things, and I just wanted to make sure that I'm right in what I'm thinking. So. Um, first is there's a bunch of people that are talking that the Hoboken Board of Ed is only responsible to the district students. This yeah. isn't a question and answer, please. Yes, please. That's fine. I'm just pausing for effect. Thank you, though. Also, this is supposed to be about the budget. I it mean, is. if you want to speak, fine, but realize there are people who are going to talk whose jobs are literally on the line. And the public session is um, what we ask you to at least respect us for. Nobody's telling you not to speak. It's just we ask to talk about the budget first. Yes, this is about the budget. And so, I repeat, um, the Board of Education is actually responsible to all of the people of Hoboken. Page 12 of your um, documents showed that. So for those people who think that the Board of Education is only responsible to Please, their district. Again, this is really argumentative. Please look at the um, chair. Don't accuse anybody. Please say what you want to say, but do it respectfully. Please. Second, the petition that you filed specifically says set aside and renew the renewal and expansion. I hear people on this board saying that they do not want to close down OLA. If you do not want to close down OLA, you must drop the lawsuit. The lawsuit specifically says on page 15, if you need a copy, set aside the renewal and expansion. Third, I would like to also clarify that this 
Petition is a lawsuit filed with the Appellate Division of the Superior Court of New Jersey, complete with litigation attorneys and judges. So these are three facts that are true. I want to address the segregation thing. I feel really offended for myself and every parent that goes to the Ola school. This is a group of people who are choosing to send their children to a school where they spend up to 90% of their day being taught in Spanish. An inherent support of diversity is embedded in their school's mission and daily reality. To assert that these families support a segregated school system is not only absurd, but it's deeply offensive. So I'm guessing I'm really wondering if it's not gonna be about segregation. Is it really about the money? And if so, why don't we think about rallying the charters together with you and changing the funding formula with the state? I ask you as a fellow parent, taxpayer, neighbor, coffee shop buddy, to please drop the lawsuit and allow my children to continue their education through eighth grade. Thank you. Keenan Moran. As an aside, I don't mind being criticized, but if you are going to criticize me for what I said, please at least read what I said. Leon Gold, Salon Magazine, but I have never said those things, and at least do us both. Have, if you've read my article in Salon, that's great. If you haven't, well, okay. okay. Next, next one. Yes, Ken Keenan Moran, followed by Brian Murray. Hi, my name is Kenan Moran. Uh, this is Olivia Moran. I live at 27 Willow Terrace. Uh, first, uh, this is an easy question. Uh, how many of you speak uh, a foreign language at this table? We're not. Uno? I'm just asking, just really quickly. One. We're not going to answer the questions. Please. Oh, okay. Sorry. How many people in this in this audience speak more than one language? Okay. Just. Okay, I just want an informal poll, sorry. Uh, well, this is what Psychology Today says about this. Uh, recent studies of children who grew up in bilingual settings reveal advantages over single language children, including both increased but attentive focus. you know focus. this isn't about the budget. I mean, I'm going to let you do what you want to do, but this is just showing no respect at all. I ask you nicely, please let the people talk about the budget. I'm I'm just, two, I'm just coming at this as a, okay, I'm just coming at this as a parent who wants to see my child attend That's Hoboken fine. High School. That's the public session. I thought this pertained to the budget. Lives are at stake. I, I'm not trying to, you, everybody's, we're all in this together. Uh, I apologize if I'm trying to take somebody's time. That wasn't my intent. I'm just only speaking out for uh, a, a collection of That's people that want to that want to stay in this community and, and uh, uh, go to high school here. Uh, uh, they don't want to listen Okay, to sorry, well, yes. Anyway, uh, please drop the lawsuit. Will you learn which list is for the public and which list is yeah, for this the is reading you, from the agenda. We just signed up a list on a list. You can come back to the public. Okay. No, nobody's well, we're not be, trying to be disrespectful or nobody's contentious. Nobody's going to be told not so. to speak. Everyone's going to have All a right. chance well, to speak. Well, we're wasting time then. I'll just let you go on. But, but you know, I had a lot to say, so because not a problem. The, the reason is, is that the agenda, the first section of public comment is on the agenda. And the agenda is about the budget. And in this room, there are many people that are here just about the agenda item about the budget. So certainly there might be people on both that are here for all different reasons that might have signed up for agenda, the agenda that's about the budget. But there's a public portion at the end where you can make comments about anything. And that's the section that if it's not directly tied to the budget. But uh, Mr. Gold's point is, that there's people that are specifically here to hear the questions on the budget. So that's why we do it this way, as we do at every meeting. Thank you. Mr. So, Chair, may I make a suggestion that when the, the board, um, the SBA, announces their name, to remind them that it's about the budget if they want to resign for the public portion because they may have thought it was one and the same. Okay, Just to remind good them. Good idea. Thank you. Okay, next person. I have Brian Murray and followed by Virginia Einstein.
Brian Murray, 701 Monroe Street. Maybe I can tie all of this together for you guys. Um, so when did you know that the budget was going to be a problem this year? Uh, I knew last year when one of the business administrators said, hey, you know, there's going to be a real problem with the um, benefits for all of the employees coming up. Uh, in fact, now the, in the current budget, it's 38.96% uh, of, uh, of the salary is for employee benefits. Um, so I knew then, and you all knew then, because you were in the same room when that guy, whoever he was, said that there was going to be a problem. Dr. Toback was there, so he saw it too. So what happened? At some point, this board said, we need a scapegoat. We are so incompetent with our budget that we need to blame somebody for the budget problem. And all of these people who have jobs on the line, like you said, they should be really angry right now that we're here today when you knew a year ago that this was a problem. And all of the Ola parents that are also here, like that, the, the father who you just shouted down with his daughter, they should be angry here too because you're trying to make them a scapegoat. So they have something in common is that their anger towards you collectively. As a parent of two kids at Wallace, I am personally offended that you're spending money on a lawsuit, a frivolous lawsuit that could be used to pay for a half a teacher. I mean, this is, it's insane. You're perpetuating a fraud with our money. I mean, if this were really about the bottom line and not about your cover-up, if this were truly about the bottom line, you might say something like, hey, you know, uh, we have all this space that uh, you know, other charter schools use. Why don't we just get a bidding war going on that? I don't advocate this at all, but if that's what you were really about, you'd say, why don't we get a bidding war going between the charter schools? The winner gets the space. The loser has no space, closes their door. We get their kids. Wow, that would make a lot of sense. Now, I don't advocate that, but if you were really about the dollars, that's what it would be about. This is all just about a cover-up. Again, you knew last year that this was a problem. In fact, next year this is going to be a bigger problem than it was this year. So these same people who will save their jobs this year are going to be faced with this next year. And then not more than a couple of meetings ago, didn't this board vote to recommend that Dr. Toback get a, a raise over the state limit? And you're cutting people's jobs? You're cutting people's jobs and you want to raise his over the state limit. I think there's really something wrong that you guys have to answer for. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Einstein, followed by Gary Enrico. My name is Virginia Einstein. I live at 1000 Hudson Street. A little nervous. Uh, I can promise it's about budgets. I got a handful of school budgets right here in my hand. Um, I am, I'm not an educated girl. I don't have a college degree. I did not go to school for economics. I did not go to business school. But I know that our own numbers are, I think, $23,000 per student. And the number two school district in the state of New Jersey spends 14000 per student. And I couldn't wrap my head around those numbers. I couldn't get why we spend so much more. And I started to look at the budgets because you produced this amazing document called, uh, I can't exactly, the user-friendly budget. It's like the nutritional guide to the budget and each school's looks exactly the same and I poured through it and I poured through it for four of the top ten school districts in New Jersey and for ours. And we do, out of the four that I chose, um, we spend an average of ten thousand dollars more per student which is a little outrageous considering they're all in the top ten and I found some places where we spend significantly more total support services and employee benefits. And I do believe that there are people here that their lives are on the job, the line. And my kid went to public school and it was amazing. And now my kid goes to Ola and it's amazing. And I wanna see every kid in the district do well. But for me, it's just a numbers thing. It's hard for me to wrap my head around $63 million to educate 2,300 students and why we can't do that. I don't 
understand it. How other districts can do it and we can't. Every parent here should be upset. And last time I was up here, I spoke and I put it in a perspective that everyone could understand and I'm gonna try to do that again tonight. We could shut the door to the public schools, all of them, the charter, every school in the district and send every kid here to private school to the tune of $17,000 a year, a private school here in Hoboken. And then we would have enough left over to make my big fat Greek wedding, Rocky, saw and paranormal activity and buy every kid in the district four shares of Apple computers. That is egregious to me. Why can't we educate these kids for that money? It's something everyone here needs to ask yourselves and ask the people sitting at this table. Thank you. Gary Enrico, followed by Nocian Versace. This, when I remember Hoboken, the Hoboken that I remember, that we all remember. My name is Gary Enrico, president of the Hoboken Education Association, the 39 year teacher. The Hoboken that when we were younger, everyone cared about each person in the district and in the town. There's an obvious, there's an obvious split in Hoboken right now. There is an obvious split, okay? And there's, there's no way around it, okay? There's no way around it. We could talk, you know, I've said things in the past about charters and they, you know, they go on the blogs and everybody's yelling. But you know who's suffering right now, who is gonna be suffering in this budget coming forward is the Hoboken public school children, all right? Who this Board of Education represents. We have four, we have four school districts in a mile square. In a mile square, we have four public school districts going on, which is absurd. When we look at the city budget, it's $120 million in a mile square. So if we do that math, what would it be in New York? How many trillions of dollars? But we don't see the outrage up there. I'm here tonight with this budget that you presented. We know, I know that there's cuts in it. Okay, I know it, you know it. I've had numerous meetings with the superintendent and certain board members, and I know how you people feel. It's just, there's really no choice in the matter. But we are going, okay, to a privatization of the school buses in Hoboken, all right? That's one of the things, I'm not gonna go through everything, but that's one of the things that's gonna take place, all right? And we could say it's their fault, it's not their fault, it's Ola's fault, that's the reality. Okay, our kids, our students, okay, will be going on buses with strangers, basically. All right? And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask transportation, could you please stand up? We've done this numerous times. These are the people who care. One minute. Well, I'm gonna ask for an extension. Okay. I'm gonna ask for an extension. All right? So we could, we could turn in any way we want. Brian, that's, that's the, the math that Brian uses when he takes his bus and he takes the people to Westfield to buy them houses. That's the negotiating tool he uses. We get people bidding against each other, all right? That's what's gonna happen. But I'm telling you, this is not gonna be the district it was, okay? It's not, it's not. No one about the per pupil cost, I, I sat on the Board of Ed. I can, I can think of no reason why I would want to raise taxes. It's just the reality of it. This is what happens. I know, Dr. Toback, how you feel about this person. We've had numerous conversations, even up to this afternoon, that I know this has taken a lot out of you. But we, I'm, I'm imploring this Board of Education, all right, to go back. Bill, you gave a great long speech about the budget. I'm asking you to go back and look at the budget again. I'm asking Dr. Toback, I'm asking the Board of Education to go back, it's not good enough. Our kids are worth more than that. And you know what, some of them only speak one language, but you know what, we don't want them on bus with strangers, okay? I don't see how this is gonna work, I really Thank don't. You. Thank you, Mr. Enrico. All right, and we'll be back here again Tuesday night. I just want you to know that. Mercy and Versace, file. Followed by Chris Munoz. 
Good evening, Roseanne Versace, grade four teacher, Wallace School. Um, when I stood before you in uh, late November, December, one of the last meetings of the, of the year, uh, numerous teachers talked about our fear that some of these cuts would have a detrimental effect on the district. And unfortunately tonight, we realized that that has come to fruition. $750 million out of our budget. Whether or not we're spending wisely doesn't, I, it makes a difference, but right now it doesn't make a difference. We know that our fellow employee, our fellow colleagues, uh, members of the transportation department, and probably other people will be losing their jobs. There will be cuts, and it will have a very, very serious effect on our students and the rest of us. Some people talked about we're going to miss our friends, we're going to miss our teachers, I'm going to miss my colleagues, I'm going to miss my students. So I ask you, I implore you to please reconsider the privatization of the of the transportation department. I have been in the business world. I have seen what privatization does. It all seems good on paper, but believe me, it never works the way you think. Everything extra, everything else that they do extra is extra, and it does cost the district, it will cost the district more money. Um, the fact that our children will be on buses with strangers, I guess you could argue, well, when they first get on the bus the first time, it is a stranger, but a lot of these people are people in the community that know these children and they trust these children and the parents trust them and they've established a relationship with them and we don't want to break that. Many of the children that get bused are special needs children. It's a change for them and they don't sometimes don't adapt well to change. So it's really something I beg you, I implore you, look at everything that you possibly can. Please reconsider, please save their jobs. Thank you. Chris Munoz, followed by Kerry Rubin. Good evening, Christopher Munoz, uh, second vice president of the Hoboken Education Association. Uh, first off, I want to commend the students that came up earlier. It must have been very hard to come out and speak in front of all these people, so congratulations. As a teacher, I'm proud of you. Okay. Um, I'd like to start off by commending Dr. Toback and the board for appealing the decision for the OLA expansion. It seems necessary to preserve the quality of student services for our district, so I applaud you in that. Um, because of the charter school expansion, it seems that we have to cut back on vital student services, transportation now, and who knows what's next, or who's next. Let me say a word just about these transportation professionals. They're more than just drivers. They're student advocates. They share in our student athletes' victories and their defeats. They care about our children. They're with them every day. That's something that cannot be changed. There are members of the community who are vital caretakers. So now because of an expansion, there's talk about dismantling this department. We're talking about bringing a private company to transport our students. That's unacceptable. These people here, they matter. They matter to the children of Hoboken, and they matter to us, and we want to see them back. I urge the board to reevaluate this year's budget with cuts to student services and loss of vital staffing. We can do better for our children. Thank you. Thank you Glenn Stoffel, followed by Charlotte Kleiman and Ariel Puevois. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Stoffel, 340 Garden Street. Um, this is about budget. This is decidedly about budget. To the folks who are in transportation, who are potentially losing their job, uh, the rhetoric that just happened, which tried to tie Ola's expansion to you losing your job, is utter nonsense. Ask this board, ask this board how much the lawsuit to shut down a successful award-winning school uh, is going to cost and relate that to how much you make. It's a very direct correlation. To try to tie those things together is positively obnoxious. In addition to that, if the, if the board is successful with their lawsuit, which is costing the taxpayers money, not only for your lawyers, but for our lawyers, for the state's lawyers, right? Three lawyers all getting funded by you, every taxpayer in this room. If you're successful with that, 
you're missing some, a budget line item, which is 250 kids who have to attend school in September. Where's that? If it costs OLA 11 to $13 to educate students, and it costs the district 20 to 26, I don't know the exact number, somebody will correct me. Uh, where's the incremental funding coming from? I see that there's a big gap that you need to address in your budget if you're successful in shutting down a successful school and putting these drivers out of work. Thank you. Yes. Susan Customarnas. Susan Customarnas, I think. And followed by Nicholas and Jake Young. I'm Susan Customeris. I live at 1125 Maxwell Lane. Um, I'm handing out two handouts right now. The first exhibit I would like to review with you is entitled The Ola Variance, because I do not agree with the calculation that was used to arrive at the Ola increase, which was reported, which is $575,000. And I apologize, but I'm nervous. So can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Yes, you're okay. fine. Um, if you look at the fiscal year 2014 number, which was projected last year, versus the amount projected this year, I get 419,000. And if I take the local share, which is what is funded by the local tax levy, I get under $400,000. So that's one. The second is I do see when I take the variance of what was projected for next year versus our actual enrollment of this year, I do get the 575,000. But that wouldn't be comparing apples to apples because what was budgeted last year was already in the base levy. So that's not a fair comparison. But when I did the comparison, I noticed that, wow, well, we're actually gonna get 156,000 less than you budgeted last year. So where does that money go? Did that get transferred to another line item? Or does that go to the back to the Hoboken tax? Do we get that back? I don't know, but that's my question. The second exhibit is um, the dollar impact of the expansion to seventh and eighth grade. I calculated this using the numbers that we reported in the charter renewal application with and without expansion. The total dollar impact over four years is a million 23. I hear see people are posting a million eight. Um, I hear numbers all over the place. One minute. The fact of the matter is, if you take that number and you reduce it by the Hoboken residents, which is about 90% based on today's demographics, and you reduce it by the local share, it's 871,000 over four years, and in not one year does it go over the 1% of the tax levy. So you keep talking about the 2%, we're eating most of it up, I understand it's a lot, but we have other options. If you can't fund it based on the current, why not propose a public vote? You could raise taxes if it was worthwhile destroying a school just because it can't fit into the constraints that we live with today is not the right answer. And then, and then my last question is for Mr. Moffitt. I don't understand. I see the 2% bank cap. I see 177,000 of a prior year bank cap being used. That gives me 2.5%, but we're raising taxes by 39 that 1.4 is unexplained right now. If you could break that down, I know that there are allowances for student enrollment or healthcare increases or pensions. If you could break that out for me, I'd be um, appreciated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Nicholas and Jake Yon, and followed by Andrea Menjadia. Hi, my name is Nicholas Young and I live at 722 Bloomfield Street. I'm here to talk, I'm here to ask you to find a way to work with the charter school so we can all move forward. 
I went to Ola from second to fourth grade, and I switched, I switched schools this year because I didn't know um, if Ola would be allowed to get a middle school. It's been hard to find a Spanish class that works at my new school because it's so different than how I learned Spanish at Ola. But I'm going to keep learning Spanish because I think it's important. Maybe most of, the gr maybe most of you only grew up with English, um, but it's different right now. We live in the fifth largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Lots of people need to know Spanish to get jobs. Speaking different languages also helps us get along better with different people. Almost all the kids I know in Hoboken speak more than one language. We want schools like Ola. Please don't shut down this amazing school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hola, yo soy Jigyeon y yo vivo en 722 Bloomfield Street. Yo soy un estudiante en Ola, en el tercer grado. Mis maestras son señorita Arce, señorita Estrella, señorita Jondi y señorita Fernández. A mí, a mí me encanta mi escuela porque me gusta aprender es, as, español y me gustan mis maestras mucho. Por favor, no cierres a Ola. Andrea Mengiadia, and followed by Matt Schwartz. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Andrea Mengiadia. I live at 606 Clinton Street. Um, my question or comment is around the 575,000, or whether it's 419,000, um, being accredited to OLA and the expansion that's in this um, in the proposed budget. My point I'd like to make is that it's money well spent. And I ask that you please drop the lawsuit and not rack up additional litigation charges um, to pursue it. All you need to do is walk down the halls of Ola. You'll see that the dual language model is working. Children of diverse backgrounds, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, native speakers and non-native speakers, as you've just seen, choose to come together for one common goal, to be bilingual and biliterate. OLA is accomplishing its mission, and it's a viable school. OLA's test scores are remarkable and continue to improve. Just last year, 2013, the test results from the NJ Pass and NJ Ask demonstrated that in every single grade, first through fourth, 95% of the students scored proficient or advanced proficient in at least one of the exam categories. OLA is thriving, and these are real results. Last month, Ola was awarded a prestigious honor of being a model program in 2014 by the NJDOE of the World Language Department. Ola is an example to follow in our state when it comes to dual language model. This is a school that our entire district should be proud of, not resisting. I understand what's fueling the resistance. It's the cost to taxpayers, the 575,000 that we talked about. But doing the math, and I look at the entire budget, this is less than 1%, and I just tell you again, I believe it's money well spent. And I please ask you to drop the lawsuit, por favor. Thank you. Matt Schwartz, followed by Felicia Palmer. Hello, uh, I'm Matt Schwartz. I live at 1119 Garden Street. Uh, I didn't plan actually on coming to speak about budget related issues, uh, but it's pretty clear the importance of it. And uh, I wanted to relate a little bit quickly about my history in Hoboken. Uh, since I've moved here, my daughter attended uh, Brandt and uh, was a member of the HOPES pre-K program. And I have a tremendous amount of not only respect, but appreciation for the experience, the work that went in, uh, everything that we as a family experienced in the public school there. And we were selected to be in OLA from the lottery, and we were very happy about that. Uh, but if we hadn't gotten into OLA, we would have been very happy to send our daughter to Wallace. And uh, we think that being a part of the community as opposed to going to a private school is an important part of being part of Hoboken. 
So when it comes to the budget and understanding the problems, uh, I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that people's jobs are on the line here. And I think that most people would understand that a problem of this magnitude and the fiscal deficit that we're at least being shown doesn't happen overnight. And as uh, Mr. Murray indicated, uh, it's, you know, there are questions could be asked about how we arrive at that. Uh, I can't get into the details of line item dissecting a budget that I don't have any closeness to. And I think anybody in this room would have a little bit of uh, either you're going on faith or you have some concern about the opacity of it and the lack of transparency and really understanding how you arrive there. It's hard to understand. It's hard to digest. And what I would say is a common sense thing would be to understand that at $23,000 plus per child in the public school system, why are we not doing as good a job in that? And if OLA is doing an outstanding job with less money, a uh, fraction of those funds and enormous community support from those families who are involved, is that a better model? And can't we do better with the funds that we have in Hoboken? There was one question about the shortfall of what would happen if these students weren't in OLA for seventh and eighth grade. And what I'm wondering, or what I imagine, is that that money isn't accounted for for those students who would wind up back in the Hoboken public school system, would be, which would be an exponential additional increase, I believe, if I understand the basics of it. Maybe it's because there's an assumption that those families probably wouldn't send their children into the public school system, not because there is any animosity against public school students or the people who work there, but because the level of achievement that has been proven and can't be disputed in OLA would lead them to believe that their child would be at a disadvantage and would be set back from what has been an outstanding curriculum achieved with less finance and an enormous amount of enthusiasm by the parents. So I would say to everybody, Summon while up, we please. have to take a look at the budget, it would be best if we did everybody a favor and dropped a lawsuit that seems to not have much merit on the financials and find a better way to resolve the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia Palmer, followed by Simone Crespi. Good evening. I wasn't planning to speak tonight. I just couldn't resist after hearing uh, what's uh, all the things that are transpiring here. I want to. Oh, I'm sorry, Felicia Palmer, 251 Washington Street. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge the public school employees. You guys do a tremendous amount of work for a very little amount of money, and you go above and beyond what you're supposed to do. And no private organization, no private organization will ever do for our children, public school children, what you do for our children. So I want to acknowledge you. And I want to I want to just I want to just uh, point out something that a gentleman said earlier. I think it was the HEA president, and he talked about uh, privatization and and uh, what's happening overall. This is an issue that's happening all across the country. It's your bus service now, and it's the cafeteria workers next. So this is a problem, and the problem results from a lack of planning. See, when people are so busy trying to resist change. They're not looking for ways to accommodate change. Now you talked about you talked about your your budget and your projections, and you've been looking. It's very very clear that there's trending, there's trending that's happening with regard to student enrollment in the public schools. And instead of looking at those realities and saying, okay, well, how do we work together to try to figure out how do we still make our financial expenses? You guys are resisting. Now, throughout history, it's very, very clear that resisting change only is going to get you stepped on. It's very, very important for you to acknowledge it, deal with the realities that you're, you're dealt with, and come up with solutions that are going to make sense. Not privatizing bus drivers, and certainly not closing successful schools. I think that the problem that really is happening here is you guys are not thinking far out. And like the gentleman said earlier, this is a problem that's never going to go away. So next year, if a lesion tries to expand, are you going to look to close them too? What are you going to do when all of these schools that are successful want to grow? They can't grow because you're going to step on them? 
You have got to come up with better solutions. How about coming up this, this area in, in Hoboken? Space is a, a, is a commodity here. Rent out some of your space. Make business incubation places that students can learn from businesses that are located inside the, in the buildings. Give some of the charter schools. Charge them for space. Deal with the realities that you're dealing with. But don't get rid of bus drivers. These people know our children and they care about our children. And don't get rid of successful schools. Those are public schools. They're they're not, they're not charter schools only, they're public schools. Thank you. Simone Crespi, followed by Robert Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Simone Crespi, 600 Jackson Street, Hoboken. Um, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who's here. Um, there's no usually no glory in uh, dealing with the budgets of textbooks and toilets. Um, it's a tough job. It's a lot of line items. Um, everything that I was thinking during your presentation, Mr. Moffat, um, I want to rethink. Um, the item that has struck me most is there seems to be a tremendous amount of divisiveness in this room. And it's both disheartening and unnecessary. To the individuals on this side, I want to tell you my mother was a New York City public school teacher for almost 30 years, which means for every, nearly every five years, when there was no contract, when the BOE had to come up with a new budget, our livelihood was at risk. As a child, we ate bulk cereal for years, and this was in an era before Costco. It is tough being on this side. However, I want to say to you, it is not Ola's fault. There's no reason why having 18 children come into sixth grade should be causing you a 4% increase in, in taxes. This is just blame shifting. I mean, I, I can't, it's mind boggling. Um, from what I understand, I was trying to understand what you were saying, Mr. Moffat, and, and I'm a really big believer. I'm sorry, is it Dr. Moffat? Mr. Moffat, I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to understand what you're saying, and I'm a big believer if you adequately and accurately name the problem, it's much easier to solve that problem. And from my understanding is there hasn't been a rerun in the formula. We have, um, by my calculation here, a 6% increase in number of students. That's 97% um, in the traditional public school, 51% charter. Um, that's 148 new students. One minute. And a 2% cap and increase. Um, that seems to be the problem, not all those 18 expansion students. Those, the students in Ola have to go somewhere. Your new students have to go somewhere. Adequately name the problem, solve that problem. Please don't blame shift. These people, these people, we're all looking for the same thing. Get something done here, but please stop banging around the buck. It's, it's not helpful anywhere. Um, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Rodriguez, followed by Barbara Martinez. Name and address, please. Hi, my name is Robert Rodriguez, and I work in transportation for 20 years. Uh, I, want you to, I want to bring up a few things about attending about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, I want to bring up a few things about attention, about some things that are being overlooked, for example. Um, your current outsource, the repairs of the buses, it is costing us $32,000 more than, we, than when we do it in-house. When we do it in-house, we are able to meet all safety standards and requirements at the small fraction of a cost. Erspec, the consulting company you hired for about $70,000 made some poor judgments and decisions to give out some runs. Due to the large amount of complaints from parents, we, are, we were able to capture three runs. This was a good amount of revenue that we lost due to their bad decision. They also brought new GPSs for two years in a row for all the buses. These consultants, by the way, are never present in the department to understand the needs or to assist the staff or manage the office on a daily basis. 
This is a $70,000 a year that could be saved, savings and using wisely on children. This same company claims that our department has 32 to 34 employees. We currently have 10 full-time full drivers, four full-time bus aides, and two part-time drivers. We are unable to perform, we are able to perform our tasks in a timely fashion, and we always put the children's safety first. Some of the other tasks we perform outside the company, we, uh, outside the company, we do, we do. For example, we do the food truck. This is done by a private company. One minute. But when the driver is out, we do it. We distribute the mail. The inner office and the US postal mail. We transport teachers to meetings in all of the schools. We deliver packages to the county from the administration building. Deliver the lawyers and offices important packages and administrations. Transport special need children and teachers. Transport nurses to all schools to give medication to children. And transport pool samples to the county. I thank you all on behalf of the transportation staff for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Martinez, followed by Jose Batilla. Good evening. Barbara Martinez, 1125 Maxwell Lane. Um, I wanted to start by mentioning, Leon, you had mentioned that we should be careful uh, what we talk about because people's jobs are on the line. I'm going to let you know that there are 20 OLA employees whose jobs are on the line on July 1st. If, if your lawsuit prevails, 100% of our employees lose their jobs on July 1st, less than two months away. So I just wanted to give you that perspective. In terms of the budget, I wanted to say for the taxpayers here, OLA educates 10% of the Hoboken public school children for 4.6% of the public school funds. We were granted our charter in 2009. That has given you plenty of time to anticipate and project for the past five years what you needed to do to be prepared for this year. This coming year, fiscal year 2015, that you're preparing for now, that you're voting on, there is no new impact there. You've known about the sixth grade for over a year. And then I think you're taking questions, but you're not answering them, but you're writing them down. My question is, of the $20,000 that you um, allocated to pay for the OLA litigation, how much have you spent? And then after that, at what point do you plan to take another vote? And how much more do you plan to spend? Thank you. Thank you. Jose Batia, followed by Tina Khan, I think. I'm Jose Valle. I live in 114th Street. I'm a very proud a parent of two kids in the public system. My daughter, Amalia Sanola, first grader, seven years old. My other daughter's in, four-year-old, she's in Hopes. And Amalia went through Hopes, too. And I was very pleased and very happy. I can tell you right now, my daughter speaks fluent in Spanish at home, learns how to read and write and work math and Spanish at school. She loves her school and her friends. It's a lot of diversity. A lot of our friends from Mola, we're all second-generation Americans. A lot of the kids are themselves second-generation Americans, so their parents are actually foreigners. So I don't know what this deal segregation is. Uh, we choose to be there. Uh, a lot of our friends that choose to be there and couldn't get in through the Lodo left town. You close the school now in July, most likely in leaving, so that's one less of so 225 students you have to educate. Maybe that's your plan, to fix the budget, that we all leave, that way you don't have to pay money for those kids. Maybe your plan. The kids that you are going to stay here, you better find the money because their parents can't leave. The sad thing about that is that I choose not to buy a house here because you don't give me security with Ola. My friends that actually bought property here, they're stuck. So you're going to have them here because they don't have that choice. I have the liberty to leave July 1st. I won't sign my lease until this issue gets done. And that's the sad thing about that. And, you know, I spend money here in this town. 
You know, I actually patronage all the restaurants in town. You know, I buy my clothes here, my shoes, I buy them here. And all that money doesn't get spent when we actually leave. So you actually should be encouraging that our schools stay, that all this doubt and this mortification doesn't happen, so we can actually plan ahead. What the Board of Education should think about is our students. Everything else is secondary. And our students are all our students. The ones that go to Wallace, the ones that go to Ola, the ones in the whole program, all the schools. They're all your students. And last, because I'm gonna mention it again, you know, it's shameful when talking about budget issues and public newspapers and magazines, we have to insult a part of our population in this town. Shameful. I was ashamed for Hoboken to read those words in Salon. Ashamed. I don't know your family members, but I was ashamed. Thank you. Tina Khan, followed by Kathleen Kilman. Tina Khan. What's going on? Not present. Kathleen Kilman. Followed by Mustafa Ozi Una. Hi, my name is Kathleen Kyleman, 212th Street. I have to say, I want to start by thanking Dr. Toback for a bit of transparency to the budget this year. It's allowed all of us to see what's happening, and that's a really good first step. And the board here has actually been fairly accessible um, in answering questions. So that is a first step. And we really, all of us, appreciate that because we can understand the numbers. Obviously, there's still a lot of numbers that are questionable and that we don't understand. Um, and I'd like to raise, I have four questions about those numbers. Um, and hopefully I'll have time to get to the main point. But on January 28th um, at the budget meeting, Dr. Toback made a comment that the Board of Ed receives about $300,000 back into your budget each year based on differences in the charter school enrollment numbers. My question is, where does this money go? Is this held for future Charlotte school, charter school enrollment increases? And does this make up some of the surplus? And if it does, why wouldn't that be used to fund the incremental that you've known about for the past five years. The second thing um, was why did the tuition go from 265K um, to 28K this year, an 89% drop? I don't understand that because it seemed to be flat relative year, year over year the past prior years. The third question is the legal costs from January budget proposal um, were 164293 In the current budget that you've just proposed, they've gone up to $210,000. Now, I'm making a big jump here, but assuming that $20,000 was already approved for the lawsuit against OLA, that you've now increased for $45,000 in legal costs. Is that related to OLA for next year? The last question is on the, in prior meetings you've talked about, this is a, a minor point, but I do have a point about it, that you're paying um, $7,500 for scaffolding outside of the Brandt School, and that you weren't going to go back and try to get, I think it's the School Development Authority to reimburse, reimburse you for the whole amount. I guess my point is, if you don't get back for the whole amount, those are jobs, those are bus drivers, those are money for Ola School. So you need to be really aggressive about pursuing any money that's being withheld by the state. And maybe there's some action items there in how you're working with the state, and maybe that's something Ola and the whole community can get behind to put more pressure on the state to um, not withhold our money and use our money for scaffolding. Um, and I guess the final point here is that there are obviously a lot of budget questions here that need to be resolved. The whole bus situation here, I don't know, you need to make hard decisions, outsourcing, privatization, they're really, really tough decisions. I've made those decisions before. But maybe you need to go back and scrub the numbers and think outside of the box. I've stood here previously and said that you're thinking inside the box. You need to step out of the box. It seems like the box is getting bigger. Let's break down that box. Maybe you could be providing bus services to the Ola kids. I don't know, but let's think outside of the box and come up with some better solutions. And my suggestion is that I don't know if you can Time's approve up. this budget, 
but maybe you need to go back and scrub the numbers more because it affects your people, it affects our people, it affects the whole community and all our children. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. Please, name and address, please. Yeah, my name is Mustafa Osturk. I live at 1300 Grand Street. And uh, before coming to the meeting here today about the budget, I, uh, I also compared uh, Union City's budget to Hoboken's. And uh, immediately a big difference uh, was apparent. Um, Union City, the local levies are about $10 million. And the total budget is about $250 million. And it receives hundreds of millions of dollars from the state compared to Hoboken, where the local levies cover most of the cost and the state, uh, the money received from the state is only 10 million. Um, I think instead of going after charter schools at $700,000, if the uh, board actually energized the public here in Hoboken, uh, we should actually, actually be going after the state and trying to get more money from the state. This is a waste of our time and efforts, honestly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enos Garcia Kime, followed by David uh, Hunt, I think. Enos Garcia Kime. Good evening. Enos Garcia Kime, 1103 Washington Street. Um, I began paying attention to school board issues here in Hoboken when my son was a toddler back in the mid 90s when the school budget was about $34 million. Um, the enrollment at that time was about 3,000 students, and uh, we still had complaints about the per-pupil costs. This is not a new issue. Um, at the time, it was explained that the, re the, the reason for the very, one uh, big, big reason for the high per-pupil costs was the senior staff. The fact that we had a district that had endured declining enrollment for many years, and they hadn't been able to hire uh, new teachers at the lower end of the pay scale, and that's what had skewed the per pupil costs because of the senior staff. Now here we are almost 20 years later and we're presented with a budget approaching, approaching $65 million to educate just over 1,700 students. Um, I wonder, I imagine that in that period of time most of that senior staff must have retired, so I wonder where the savings are. Uh, in that period of time, we also saw the opening of two charter schools, which are not educating nearly the almost 1,000 students, over 1,000 students that we have lost in enrollment in the district. So we actually have fewer children enrolled in all public schools in Hoboken 20 years later. Um, I believe that charter schools have been a stabilizing force in our, this, in our city's demographic. And I believe that they have also forced the public schools to become more progressive. We see things like well-attended budget workshops. We see things like open houses. These are all good things. But what bothers me is how, as other speakers have mentioned, when we are faced with a tax, potential tax increase, we begin to point fingers at people who are actually the good guys, you know. Um, I think that the charter schools are doing a tremendous job in not only educating 15, 10, 15 percent of our public school enrollment um, at a lower cost and providing an alternative um, because I don't believe that in education, as I hope most of you believe, one size certainly does not fit all. Um, it bothers me as a union member, as a, as a unionist, that we are pitting one union against the other, that we are put, pitting worker against worker, and ultimately we're also pitting resident against resident. I think we have to look at better solutions. I wonder what our costs are at the high end of the payroll. Um, like other, another speaker has, has commented, and it was reported in the press, this board moved to appeal to the state to raise the superintendent's salary over the cap. I noticed in the numbers here that one of the costs that is increasing is education. Now, 
Is that because perhaps we gave away the store to the teachers union when we negotiated a contract three years ago? Again, this is something that bothers me, pitting one person against the other. I think we do have to do a better job at looking where the real waste is and go back to the numbers, not threaten people who are doing a good Ms. job Garcia with elimination Cotton of their programs. Please, we want well, to be fair to Thank you. Thank you. David Hunt, right. followed by uh, Daria Mr. Martin. Just so we have a sense, so, be, so we can vote, and then how many more do we have for the budget? Then, of course, there's the public After portion. David and Mr. Hunt, and it's three. Th okay. And then we can vote, talk about it, then we can have the public portion. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, is uh, Mr. Hunt available? Present. No. Dina Muradian. Followed by uh, Yasmin Petroselli. Good evening. Um, in the presentation, there was a slide name, about. Name and address, oh, sorry. please. It's okay. Sorry. Dina Muradian to Constitution Court, Hoboken. Thank you. Um, in the presentation, there was a slide about um, the in-house legal fees, and so I'm curious if the $20,000 that was approved to file the petition against OLA with the Department of Education was considered in-house or out-of-house legal fees. Um, and then related to that, if this petition and the notice that was of appeal that was filed in the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Division requires further legal action um, I assume that those are out-of-house counsel fees, and what are the estimated fees, and how are they affected or reflected in this budget? Um, my next question is regarding um, the petition, and the petition says that it seeks for the renewal and expansion of OLA to be set aside, and that the commissioner should reassess granting the renewal and expansion. So if OLA's charter currently expires in July 1 of this year, and the commissioner were to approve this, this grant of reassessing and holding off on the renewal. There is, I guess, the potential that the school would not open in September. So my question regarding the budget is that if that were the case, what is the board's plan to incorporate those 250 students into the district in terms of space, funding, teachers, et cetera? If the per student budget is currently around $23,000. And the amount that you give to OLA, which I think is about $2.4 million and equates to something around $10,000 per student, if that money is rolled back into the budget and added to your $24,000 per student, when you average out the per student dollars, it comes out that you're getting less per student than your 23,000 per student. That doesn't, hopefully that made sense. I know it's very difficult to understand. One and minute the, left. The, um, you know, I'm not a finance person, but it just seems that if the $2.4 million rolled back in, I question how you'll fund the additional staff that's needed for those 250 students. So um, my question is how will that be reflected in the budget? Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Yasmin Petroselli followed by uh, Isabella Gibbs. My name is Yasmin Petroselli and I live in 1240 Peck Avenue. Dear Board of Ed, my name is Yasmin Petroselli and I'm a fifth grade at OLA. I've been attending since second grade. I love OLA. It is very unique and the only school in Hoboken that teaches you every subject in Spanish, except English, of course. We speak Spanish in math, science, STEM, social studies, all specials, even during recess and lunch sometimes. Every day I go into class feeling very excited to speak and learn through Spanish. Every year I get better and better at speaking this language. I bet that when I'm in eighth grade, I will be fluent. When I grow up, I plan to visit various Spanish-speaking countries, and Ola is preparing me by making me bilingual. This is why I would like Ola to expand to eighth grade. Please don't stop my school. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Last speaker, Isabella Gibbs. Hola, mi nombre es Isabella Gibbs Garcia y yo, voy, y yo vivo en 721 Madison Street. Hi, my name is Isabella Gibbs Garcia and I live on, in 721 Madison Street. 
I am a fifth grader at Ola. I started Ola when I was in second grade when Ola opened in 2010 and I have been there since then. I have learned so many new things in math, science, English, and Spanish. I know I have more things to learn. I was so excited once I was told that Ola was going on to eighth grade and all my friends were really excited too. Now that I hear that some people are trying to take away our expansion, I am very surprised and sad. The students of Ola want to stay at our school for as long as we can. It is our second home. We love Ola and we want Ola to grow, not just for us fifth graders, but for all of the kids behind us. I am sure that all the other children who are in Ola, Hoboken, who attend other schools, feel the same way. I know I would never want that taken away from them. It is a very scary feeling to think that Ola would not go up to eighth grade. Like I said, Ola is my home and my family. A big part of who I am is thanks to the teacher of, teachers of Ola. Please help us keep our school growing. Thank you and gracias. Thank you. <laughs> so, this is the last speaker for the um, budget portion, right? That is, that is correct. Okay, what I'd like to do is have, um, if any of the administrators want to say anything, then the board members can say what they want to, and then we can have a vote. Okay? Anybody want to comment? Please, Dr. Tobin. So I, I just have um, some answers to a number of the questions that were asked. I don't have all the answers. It's not, not um, not on short notice, but I have a number of answers that I think will be helpful. Um, so, it's one of, one of the first things that is very important to address, which is sort of semi-related to the budget issue, is the issue of this petition, okay? Now, there's a few things I think that are very important to understand, okay? First of all, the petition that all of you have read is directed almost completely at the New Jersey Department of Education, okay? And the, the point being that if you look at the petition, we ask the Department of Ed to do specific things, okay? Now, as far as there, there are some, some very important things to understand, because it is directed at the Department of Ed, the Board of Ed has ultimately asked the Department of Ed to take action and look at their actions and look at the impact of their actions on the district as required by law. Okay? So you could read the petition and you can understand that there are, some, there are some issues there. Now, if the commissioner comes forward and makes a decision, right? If he, gets, if, if he makes a decision, because ultimately the person who was, I guess, identified by the commissioner to make the decision isn't, according to the law, the person to make the decision, and we appeal to the commissioner, the commissioner might look at the situation and may agree, may disagree, but the point is there's not really much cost for that. Now, as far as the cost that the district has expended so far, so the district in total has expended about $12,000, okay? That is where we are right now, and that is to get us to where, the point where we are. There is no need to go beyond that if the Department of Ed does what we have asked them to do which is go back and look at the issue and follow the rules that are attached to making a decision about a charter school and an expansion of charter school. One of the big concerns, and this is another thing that um, I guess needs to be connected, directly connected to the budget, the issue of the $575,000, okay? So that number appears in our budget. That is a number that appears in our budget along with other increases for the other charter schools. Added together is about $780,000. Our budget for this district would not be approved if we did not include that number. Now, there's also this other question about, well, if there's a change of enrollment, do you get any money back from the charter schools for, for the allocation? The answer is the charter school provides an approximation of the enrollment. And then sometimes, if the enrollment projections are off, then we get some money back but keeping in mind that we also have the surplus that we need to develop because we've been trying to do the best we can for the taxpayers by developing a surplus and budgeting it back to the taxpayers. So that's also, that's a very important point. Now, the other thing to understand is there have been a lot of comments regarding the expansion of OLA and this year it's not costing us anything. Well, that's true, the expansion of seventh and eighth grade is not costing us anything this year the expansion of sixth grade 
is a $575,000 proposition. That's what's in our budget. That is what the Department of Ed says we have to include in our budget. It comes in a, in a statement that we can certainly make public, that we can show you this is the number that we must place in our budget. As a result, we have to accommodate, make our budget, do what we need to do with our budget to allow for that number to fit into our budget. That happens in a lot of different ways. So the other thing is that I think we've been pretty clear. The Department of the, the Board of Ed has, has said, I wrote in my letter, the expansion of OLA up to sixth grade. We wrote, we, we support that up to sixth grade. Here's the problem. Well, I certainly wrote that in my letter. Now, what happens now, okay, so the sixth grade expansion happens next year. And there's a cost to that. And there's lots of other issues the district has, which quite honestly, I mean, maybe people say, well, there wasn't a plan. There's certainly been issues we've been aware of a number of years, but there are certain things you can't plan for, okay? But as far as the expansion of OLA, that's something we didn't know about. We know that the, the charter school <coughs> applied for an expansion in a prior year and got the expansion, got the approval. The renewal and expansion are contained in the same document. So the petition says we want to set aside the renewal and expansion. It doesn't mean that anyone's seeking to just end OLA or end any other charter school. What it means is that there is a document, an expansion, that is included as part of a renewal, the same document. And we're asking that to be set aside and for the commissioner to look at the situation, including looking at different remedies that work out well for everybody, including funding, including some other action that the commissioner may take to, to assist the community with some of the, the demographic issues that are there. So when you add that together, that's what, that's what the Board of Ed is asking, that's what the petition says, and I think it's very important to not read any further into that. It doesn't mean that we're trying to shut down OLA. It doesn't mean that we're trying to um, do anything um, that, that's inappropriate. What we're trying to do is look out, so after this year, and you've heard about our budget, and I've told you there are six factors that are affecting our budget, Right In the beginning, there were six important factors that will have a major impact on our budget, not only now, but in the future. Now, over the next week, we're going to have to make a whole lot of very difficult decisions. And you've heard about some of them. There's more to come. So our whole point in looking at this expansion is saying to ourselves, well, what does that mean? If nothing else changes, okay, and a lot of things we don't control. We don't control what we receive in terms of state aid. Okay? We don't control school choice. It's all controlled through the Department of Ed and how much money we receive for that. We have limited control over the tax levy, and as you heard, the tax levy situation is complicated because even if we raise the tax levy to the maximum of 2% down the road, the public schools, the traditional public schools, don't see a penny of that. So when you add all that together, what does that mean, not this year, but the year after that and the year after that? And so yes, we are planning, and I think you can understand that if over the next few weeks you see substantial job loss, and you understand that in the next few years that if nothing else changes, we're gonna have a hard time figuring out what's left. So we need the department to intervene, we need another look at this situation, and we need the Department of Ed to do what I asked them to do in the first place, which is before you make a decision, please come, and look in detail about what your decision means to the students who attend the traditional public schools, because it does make a difference for them. And many speakers tonight have said, well, yes, they are going to notice, things will change, and indeed that could happen. Now, the budget cuts we have for all of our parents, we have done everything that we can, and we continue to do everything we can to protect direct instruction, what's happening in the classroom, protect teaching positions, keep class sizes reasonable, so if that is a goal, which is a, a worthwhile goal and something that all educators generally aspire to under these circumstances, well then, yeah, we have, we have a lot of other decisions to make and it, it eliminates some other decisions that we could make if the classroom and the students are the priority. So you see, all this is going on and I know that there's been a lot of comments about, well, maybe this should be done, that should be done. We spent months looking at, thinking about, looking at different options and that will continue to go on until we, we get to our, our budget hearing or, I'm sorry, our, our staffing meeting next week. But in the meantime, the, um, the other thing is that as far as um, the idea of scapegoating, there's no, there's no scapegoating going on here. There's no blaming anybody. We're giving you the factors. We're giving you the, the, the facts about our budget. 
and those, those factors are the things that shape our budget, like every other school district. There are factors that shape your budget. We have factors, every other district has factors, the charter schools have factors, it's just what it is. The, um, the, other, the other thing, the common misperception, and honestly, we've, we've addressed this quite a few times, People regularly say we have like a $65 million budget for 2,000 students or 1,500 students or something like that. And there's all kinds of cost per pupil figures. Our budget is not, when you take out the early childhood program, right, which is kind of a separate budget, you take out the charter school allocation, it's nowhere near that. It's nowhere near that. Our budget is about $46, $47 million, okay? How many students? When you take that out, okay? Now, the, um, the other thing, is the, um, what is the question? Okay, so we talked about the 575,000. Um, okay. Can you talk about the per pup pupil per pupil cost. cost? I think you were saying that. Well, the per pupil cost is, is certainly not $26,000. And right. quite honestly, there's also the, um, so our, our per pupil cost is listed in our, our advertised budget. Was it, it's, it's our anticipate, or what do we have? The total here? budgetary comparative per pupil cost is 22,199. Okay. That's all in. Now, $22,000, and you say to yourself, well, that's crazy. After all, the, um, the, the, the charter schools educate students for much less. Now, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about that because remember what I was saying in the beginning here, the Department of Ed, not us, the Department of Ed determined that the mix of students that we have would actually require, according to them, another $2.3 million in funding to adequately fund their education. That takes into account the mix of students we have. In other words, our special ed population, our out-of-district placements, our in-district special education programs, our students will receive funding who are economically disadvantaged. There's funding for that. There's a lot of different factors. There's ELL, English language learners. There's a variety of different ways that our students qualify for additional funding. So there's something called, and I encourage you all to look for this, because it's out there. It's a document called All Students, All Communities. So if you Google it, it'll pop right up. It's about the state school funding formula. And it will tell you exactly what the cost of education should be. If you look towards the back, it'll tell you if you, are, if you have a child who is in a, in a K to five school, right? And there are no other factors they're not a special needs child in, in, in their elementary school, right? Elementary school is a part of it. Then the cost of education should be about ten dollars to $12,000 per student. That's what it should cost. That's what the per pupil cost should be. So the point being that OLA receives a different level of funding. They receive, but that, it very well will be that you're actually receiving funding that makes, that the state considers to be adequate. So that's another important factor. On the other hand, our mix of students requires a different level of funding according to the state, and our level of funding is $2.3 million less than what it's supposed to be. So these are all very important factors and things that I think I, I, I very much appreciate the comments, and, I, and it's good to be able, like I said, to talk about the budget. And I appreciate the, um, the enlightened way that many people came up and spoke about their concerns about the budget, about what's happening here in the district, and so I thought that was, that was really a very good thing. I'm just gonna look through real quick to see if I have I any more question questions. question about the incremental cost per student. For example, if you add one student to a classroom, does, that doesn't add $23,000 to. Right. right, there's also the, the, the reality of incremental cost, right? If you take a group of 25 students and you distribute them at different grade levels throughout the district, right, maybe, maybe that adds one or two students per class in different places, right? Not in every classroom. We have the capacity to do that, we have the desks, we have the, the books, we have all the things we need. It wouldn't increase the cost per pupil. If you add 50 students to the mix, it's not going to, I'm sorry, it, it won't increase our actual costs. We have capacity, that's why we have the school choice program, to balance out our enrollment and to allow students to attend the schools and fund those seats where we have space. That's, that's a very important part. Now, um, I guess the other thing is that, as far as there was a question about K to six and the fact that um, if, was there a plan to accept the students from Ola back into our, our school system and is there a budget? We don't expect that to happen. We don't expect to, to, that, that Ola would shut down. So no, there is no, we, we made no plans for that. It's not in the budget. It's not anticipated enrollment. It's not any of that. Because we don't expect that to happen. We don't. 
Um, the original charter was K to five. Like I said, there was an expansion to sixth grade and we're absorbing that. But the seventh and eighth grade is, is gonna be quite a, quite a hit for the district and, and quite an impact when you, when you consider, like I said, our budget situation, not this year, but then the following two years. That's where it's gonna be very tough for the district. So um, those are my comments for now, unless board members, you have questions for me or for Mr. Moffitt. Yeah, what, what I'd like to do is, what I'd like to do is go down and if you have any comments or questions, then we could vote, so please. Um, I just have to, um, I don't know who would answer this, if it would be Mr. Moffitt or Dr. Toback. The, there were two questions that were asked by members of the public. One was about the 1.4%. Um, is she still here? She had asked that question. About the bank cap. Yeah. And the other one was, in, was about the uh, legal fees, about the, what was budgeted in this budget for the legal fees for the lawsuit. I would ask you. Okay. Well, the 2014-2015 the budget has about $210,000 for legal expenses. The current um, legal purchase order is for $20,000 which is what we, we approved as a board, uh, not to exceed, and that comes out of the 13-14 budget. So. That has nothing to do with next year. This has nothing to do with next year. And the 1.4 percent? Yeah, that, that I, um, I'd have to sit down with that individual. Um, I, I don't know where 1.4 percent comes from. Again, it's I think, back I think from what information. Was, I, yeah. From what I understand is that we're using... She's right there. Okay, if Susan. You, if you don't mind, if she could just ask it again because... Sorry, I had my daughter on my lap and she didn't want to get up. So my question was, when we're increasing from the tax levy amount from fiscal year 2014 to 2015, it's increasing by 3.9%. Right. So I wanted a breakdown of that. I broke down the 2%, that's the cap that you're allowed to do without any reasons, then you have the 175000 that came from the prior year banked cap, that was about a half a percent. So there's 1.4 percent in explanation that I'm looking for. Yeah, that's, the, that's the cap waiver. Well, yeah. Right, yeah. it's the cap waiver, but you have to have the reasons, like your we, enrollment. There, there's a like, reason to do it because we did not spend the money in the previous years. So we're That's the bank cap. Yeah. I don't yes. want to cut you off, but I just don't want this to go all night. Excuse me? Yeah. No, I'm saying that's the bank cap. I, I understand that. That's right. 177000 That's on your agenda tonight. We also have some cap left for next year, if that's what you're asking. Nope, well, that's not if I could just, maybe, maybe I could touch on a point because I think I might, might have a better understanding now. If you're asking me, uh, you, you increase tax levy by 1.4, which is a slide, how that breaks down, which would include the 2% cap, an adjustment for enrollment, and then the use of bank cap. That would, that would be the the reason that that goes to a million four. Right, so my question is, it went up by 3.9%, right? We're breaking it down. The 2% cap, I get. Right. The half a percent for the bank cap, I get right. that. And in between is And there's 1.4% an about $600,000 that the tax is being increased. Okay, the difference, and I want to know the what difference the I can, is. is contributed to, an, a, they call it an adjustment to the cap, yeah. and it has to do with increased enrollment based on our historical increase that we have in the budget. So okay, that so would include that difference. So that's for the 93 incoming kids? The 600,000 is attributed to them? The increased enrollment, that's part of it, yes. But, that, that, but that that's only a projected through. enrollment, correct? See, uh, that's a projected enrollment number, right? Right, now, okay. Based that, on the Department of question. Ed parameters. Okay. Right, it's within, there's a, a ceiling and a, and a floor, and we're well within it. As a matter of fact, they review it pretty thoroughly with the budget review by the county office. We fall in between our historical range, uh, and therefore it's adjusted uh, as far as an, an increase to the potential tax levy. So that's right. why we can, can move that. So there's three portions. One is a 2% increase, one is the adjustment for enrollment growth, mm -hmm. and the other is the use of bank cap. Great, okay. Can I ask one more question? Does the enrollment of the charter school kids increase fall within that wavered amount? Like, could you go and raise taxes without a public like vote is, uh, for enrollment of charter school kids increasing, just like you um, can for district yeah. schools? Please, yeah, it's uh, yeah. just getting so many. No, it's just it's, one more question. It's no, kind if of you have a general question, please, I want you to <laughs> okay. ask it, but what, well, we what is the gist of the question? Yeah. So the question is, the question. there's an exemption 
right? You could raise the tax levy for exemptions. One of the exemptions is the increased student enrollment. So when we talk about the 2% cap, it's not really a 2% cap. You can raise taxes without public vote for other reasons. Student enrollment is one of them, increase. And we're doing that for the district budget for the 93 kids, and that's about $600,000 attributed to that. So can you use that same waiver for charter school growth? Yeah, and it's a separate budget. The charter yeah, it, schools have a separate budget. Okay. And it has no impact on it. And so all we get is a bill. Right, okay, but the tax levy, like you're authorized to raise taxes, can you be authorized to raise the tax to cover the charter school growth under the same waiver? No. No, no. okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, Fran? That was it. Peter? Fran touched up on uh, two of the questions I had, but Dr. Toback, just for clarification purposes, we were discussing the $575,000 for OLA, and you said that the Department of Education gives us that number, correct? Yes. So therefore, in terms of the way they calculate it, we just have to basically take their number and not the number that I believe Susan, who gave us this handout, said, and that's 419000 correct? There are lots of people who could do lots of different calculations based on lots of different reasons, and so that's why the Department of Ed gives you a number. Okay, so we just have to follow that number. Yes. And in terms of the, uh, the legal costs for... Um, this verified petition that was sent out, uh, 20,000. I know we put a cap on legal fees. Are we still under that cap now? I'd have to check, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. And Dr. Tobek, just uh, if you clarify something, you mentioned that if you eliminate early childhood and charter school funding from our overall budget, it equals out to, I think you said 46, 47 46. million. Um, I was just wondering if you could just for the audience, because I know a few uh, parents uh, responded to that. How many students uh, do we have in traditional K to 12 public school right now, traditional public school? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the exact enrollment yeah. right now yeah. is probably somewhere in the 17 to 1800 range. I mean, I don't know the enrollment as of today, but somewhere in there. Okay, um, that, that's it. Okay, but this is also our comments before we vote. Plus, I'm, you know, we're, so if you have a concern, so Fran please, might uh, want I, I've asked all okay. my questions. Uh, Jean Marie? No, I'm okay. No. Anything? Rudy? Um, so are we, are we going to make general remarks now, too? After we're or? all done, we're going to hold the vote. Okay, and then we're done. Okay. So I said after we're done talking, we're going to have that vote, then we'll go to the public session. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention there were some, the, the questions in terms of the dollars we were spending, and I, I thought it was the gentleman that was talking about Union City brings up a very interesting point, which is in the fact that they have a $10 million tax levy, that's what's coming just out of uh, people's taxes, versus $250 million coming from the state. And so their budget is predominantly state and probably federal funds that are also in that number. And the, we have a similar thing in Jersey City. There's also a very skewed, um, s small comparative local tax levy for schools versus an enormous mm -hmm. amount uh, for their children. Of course, these are much larger districts. Uh, Jersey City is 27,000. I don't know what the numbers are in Union City, but it, it's an interesting point to bring up. And in Hoboken, we don't have that same difference. Our tax levy is 39, which is our local burden for the schools on uh, the local community. Uh, and uh, the difference between the 65 and the 39 is obviously what we get from the state and the federal government. But a lot of what the reasons for those huge state and federal amounts, and even the reason for our amount here, is because we are this so-called Abbott District. And we have to remember that there's only 30 districts in the state that have this designation. And we have this designation because we have a population of students that is have factors that make them require more funding. And those children, they call them academic factors, but an ac one of the academic factors is 
being at the poverty and you know impoverished children. So when you look at a comparison, and I certainly understand this because five years ago, I was not on the board and I was a parent and I was concerned about schools. And it was there, and, and these numbers, I did take the number that the whole budget was and I did divide it by the numbers in the students in the, in the uh, district schools. I was making all the, and they are innocent mistakes in evaluating the system that some of you are. And they're innocent mistakes because they're what makes sense. But if you're part of one of those 30 districts, okay, that means that we have, we're the, the 30 districts in this state that have the greatest number of children that are more expensive to educate. That also, there's another thing about that group. And the other thing about that group is they don't test as well. And that's part of the reason we have to, why the state is committed at, to providing additional funds to the former Abbott districts. I'm just gonna call them Abbott districts after this because that former thing reminds me of Prince. So the whole, so this, so that's what we have here. And now that's true. Our test scores are lower than the 10 or four, I forget what the gentleman used, districts that he were looking at that were only $14,000 a year. But that's because those districts are not Abbott districts. Those districts are not educating a population of children that are, it's much more intense and much harder to get them to perform as well as socioeconomic, comfortable children. That could be a middle class student. It's a student that's not impoverished, okay? And that makes a big difference. When we, so when someone comes to the podium and is not a parent in our school and isn't experiencing what's happening with their child, who's the same demographic as you, uh, the group that has that isn't going to the school right now that it's come to speak, they have to understand that my child performs very well on the NJS, which he better be getting in bed for for tomorrow. And he performs well and it's not I, I definitely attribute it to the wonderful educators that he's having in the district. I've been more than pleased. But it's also because he has the benefit of a birthright that gives him the ability to have a much easier time testing that way. And I think that it's really important that when you're looking at our district from the outside, that you recognize that this is not, that the lack of performance that you're perceiving is actually not true. And that if you're only, if we're one of the 30 districts in this state that are all the way that require what they that require this special funding that has to be taken into consideration the other thing that you have to remember that we're a comprehensive k-12 district that includes a high school and high school students just like middle school students seventh and eighth get a larger amount of money in the charter school allocation than your k-2-3 population and your four to six population High school students are more expensive to educate. Comprehensive high schools are more expensive. The other thing that was raised was the tuition increase, and those are for the children that we educate that we can't educate in our buildings, and they have placements to go out. So when you see an increase like that in the budget, it's because there are additional children that are being sent to outplacements, and those outplacements can be very, very expensive, but it's the best thing for their children. And that gets to me, what is actually the most important thing to me is that we have very dedicated employees and you are very appreciated. And I, as well as everybody on this board, really, really cares about every one of you. And we really wish that there were different circumstances for what is going on. And it is not, It. I know that there's other, and. There's other discussions that are going on here, but you are certainly foremost to me 
and the children, and part of the other thing about our transportation budget is, as everybody knows, we do not bus general ed. This is a non-busing district. Every child that gets on a bus in this district is a child that is of that's, that's being bused because they have very special educational needs. And they are children that really need to be coddled and cared for. And I have been absolutely opposed to the outsourcing of transportation from the beginning because I knew that it wasn't like busing, outsourcing routes in a general public school suburban district where you have a bunch of rowdy kids getting on the bus and they're all, it wasn't about that. And so this has been particularly difficult for all of us that this had to be where, because we're trying to preserve what's going on in the classroom, it's very, very difficult. And the other part of this petition that is not being raised is that it's about addressing the charter school law and the law in the charter schools. And the law in the, char the, law in the charter school, the charter school legislative law. And in it, it talks about being reflective of the district. And nobody is saying, and I said this in something I posted publicly, it's an unintended segregative effect. And it's not the fault of the lotteries as they are set up. Because the lotteries as they are set up is how the state says to do the lotteries. And in this community, it's not working. It's not working because you get a situation, and everybody's seen this chart. We didn't make up this chart. Somebody else made up this chart, and we found it. This shows what's happening here. And that includes socioeconomic, you know, where the child is that way. But in our district, that actually turns into a discussion about race as well. And nobody's saying it's on purpose, but there has to be a way to, diverse, to, to, affect, uh, to address it. And people have spoken about the arts out, uh, outsourcing and being from corporate America. I'm in corporate America. When you're having a problem like this, you have address it through a diversity plan. There needs to be a diversity plan for this whole community to make sure that we're all attracting every child, every type of child. And that can only be done if it's addressed through the state because the state is his mandates how we're supposed to, how everyone, you all, how the lotteries are supposed to run. And that's the only way it's addressed. And we ask them to address it with Da Vinci. And we're asking, and we ask them to address it again in Dr. Tobeck's statement. And we're not, they've not given us anything back about that. And you're all seeing what's happening to the funding. And that's what that petition is about. And no one, and we had for four years have gone from four million to an eight and a half million dollar charter. And we've absorbed that and we've planned for that. It was not unplanned for. We've been absorbing that through cuts and saves and trying to keep the levy flat and trying to make everybody happy. And now we've hit a wall and we're saying if this is the way public education is going to be, then you have to help us with this funding. And you have to help us to make sure that we're not doing something unlawful here. Because this is unlawful. If this chart said Cap Cape Town, South Africa, at the top of it, we'd all be screaming about it. And that's the point. So that's what, that's what it's about. It's nobody is doing it on purpose. You know, I sat here and listened to everyone for well over an hour. I have a right to say these points. That is what, well, every, it bothers everybody as soon as you mention that. As soon as you say that, if you, you have to look at this for what it is. Nobody's saying anybody did it on purpose. But everybody has to agree that it's, in, that it's not correct. Thank you. Um, let, let it, we're all finished. You'll have the public portion. You'll have the public portion. Next. Uh, well, no, I'll talk to you later no, please, about it. I, I was just trying to give you please. an Okay. Um, I would like to say something. Um, as the newly appointed board member, I had major aspirations and hopes and dreams of changing our school system for the better. And that means for all our students in all our schools. And I would never have imagined that I'd be sitting here with these decisions and with these comments in my entire life. I find it devastating and saddening that we have to make some tough choices to people that are going to be greatly missed and are loved in our community. And I feel terrible about that. And I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Excuse me. Please. That's highly inappropriate. Please.
Officer. Officer. I'm telling you. But here we are. And somehow we need to go forward. And the actions that we are taking tonight are letting us go forward. And even though those actions are going to be very, very painful for most of the people involved. And for that, that's what saddens me. And I'm truly very appreciative of every one of our staff members and employees. And I thank you for all your hard work and dedication. Okay, Tom, anything? Okay, um, this really is awful. We know what our budget problem is. I, um, I just hope we can work something out, but uh, we need a budget and now we're going to have a vote. So please, I, anybody want to make a motion for a consent agenda? Uh, I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Coral. Please. Mr. Biancomano? No. Ms. Evans? Yes. Mr. Cluffell? Yes. Ms. McAllister? Yes. Ms. Mitchell? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes Kearns? No. Ms. Sobolov? Yes. Thank you, Clark. Ms. Stromwall? Yes. And Dr. Gold? Yes. We're going to take a three minute break, then we'll do the uh, public session. Okay. Is We're actually okay? going to start now. Because that works better because then I don't Is have it? to worry about losing it on my. All right. Are but you can all have here? this one if you want. Do we have to we do something to get back in session? Or? All right. How many public speakers do we have? Estimate 33. All right, uh, three minutes each. We'll be here for an hour and a half. Okay, let's start. First speaker is Aaron Kanako, I think. And actually, with three individuals, I think children. Sophia Jack and uh, Ferreira. And this next speaker will be Isabella Mateus. I'm Jackson Barrer, and I live 1027 Park Avenue. I do not think that it is fair that you are suing a really good school. I don't want to lose this awesome and well-educated school. Also, all of my favorite teachers teach at this school. I also think that Ola is a great school because it will help me a lot in college, and I will learn different languages. It will also help me travel to different countries. If Ola did not exist, I would move somewhere else, and that would not be really good. That is why you should not shut down Ola. I'm Sophia Barrer and I live on 1027 Park Avenue. Ola. Ola is my school. I've been going there since it opened. First grade. It's really cool how we get to learn two languages, English and Spanish. I don't believe it's fair that you are suing this awesome school. In a year or two, I will be speaking Spanish fluently. I don't want to lose that. Please save Ola. Thank, Thank you. you. Isabella Mateus, followed by Tim Haldren, or Waldron. Okay. Uh, my name is Isabella Mateus, and this is my younger sister, Sarah. We both attend Ola Hoboken Charter School. We love Ola and will fight to attend the school until the eighth grade. The majority of the school age children do not have the opportunity to attend a dueling good school like us. If I had not attended Ola, I would not be able to speak or understand the Spanish language, as I do now. I couldn't talk with my grandfather in California and my uncle in Florida in Spanish. Where would I go after the fifth grade? I just don't understand why you would want to let Ola, why you would not want to let Ola expand. It is a successful school, right? <laughs> Isn't your job to give children like me a great education? I want other children and my sister to have the same opportunity that I have, have had with Ola. 
I want them to grow up in a dual language environment. Let's work together to make Ola a place that not only has choices for us kids, but is a great place to not, wait, grow up and learn and become citizens of the world. Thank you for your time, and I hope that I will be the second class to attend eighth grade at Ola. Please drop the lawsuit, por favor. Kim Waldron, followed by Aaron Boyjan. Hi, I'm Tim Waldron. I live at uh, 530 Madison. And uh, I think we can all agree that education is critical, uh, not only to an individual, but to a community's success. Could you actually bring the microphone up? Sorry, Sorry about that. Thank you. So when my wife and I were uh, looking for a place for our growing family, we have three children, uh, we thought that Ola was a unique opportunity. It offered something that nobody else, we couldn't find anywhere else, uh, anywhere near here. And uh, because of Ola, we've decided to stay in Hoboken for the long term. And I think these are things that uh, are missing from everyone's, or from the Board of Education's uh, decision to sue uh, Ola and, uh, and stop the expansion. Because this is about community. And this is about, uh, about the, the fabric of community and, and enabling families to stay in, in places. Look, we're all faced with uh, a situation where we don't have a lot of space. It's an urban environment. But being at Ola is uh, something that we value. Uh, and you know, as everyone here has said, the test scores are great. The community is great. It's a diverse community, representative of our community. So I'm left wondering, what is this about? Why are you trying to, to stop this? Is it about the students? No, it's not about that. Because if it was, you'd be celebrating our uh, OLA success, right? It's, it's a fantastic program. Is it about the money? Maybe a little bit. But OLA is only 10% of the student population in, in Hoboken. It's 4% of the budget. And if all of OLA's students went back to the Board of Education, you'd have bigger financial problems. So wh what, what is it about? Is it about freedom of choice? No, it's not about that either. One minute. Uh, because you take in students from other districts, but you're not allowing the same freedom of choice for our students. So this is about the Board of Education's need for control. It's about the Board of Education's need uh, for power. It's about your chronic mismanagement of the budgets. It's not about OLA. OLA is a model uh, program uh, and provides a unique educational opportunity for our students. You need to support this. You need to drop the lawsuits, por favor. Thank you. Aaron Boyajian, followed by Jack Herman. Aaron Boyajian, 547 Bloomfield Street. I have two daughters in Ola, kindergarten and fourth grade. Um, obviously, my immediate concern um, is the relief requested in the petition. I know, Dr. Toback, you said in your letter, it's not about um, stopping our renewal. That's not what the suit says. I'm an attorney. I read it cover to cover. Um, you can um, separate out causes of action. So, you know, I would ask if that's your position, if that's the board position, that it's not about renewal and it's about the expansion, then call up Matt Thessel tomorrow and ask them to put in a caveat that it's not about the renewal. It's first. Um, you know, as a taxpayer, I'm funding this suit against my kids. On March 11th, the board authorized $20,000, uh, capped is what the resolution said, to fight this suit. Um, you know, your retainer agreement with Meth Vessel says there's no cap. It doesn't say anything about a cap. So it could be 20000 it could be 50000 it could be 100000 You said that you think the $12,000 was spent. That's what the invoices look like so far, so that's on point. But, you know, any lawsuit that happens, it's not just one filing, and that's the end of the fees. Um, OLA is going to defend themselves. DOE is going to defend themselves. I'm spending that money, too. Um, you know, as a taxpayer, uh, OLA gets money. I'm paying that out and out of legal fees. As a state taxpayer, I'm paying that money too. Um, there's going to be motion practice if this thing keeps going. So the $12,000 you said, you think that's all it's going to cost, is not all this is going to cost. 
Um, and what happens when you hit that $20,000 cap? It costs you $12,000 just to bring this petition. Motion practice happens, discovery. <laughs> this thing is going to go well beyond 20. So how do you go back to the well to get more money to pay for that? Um, I don't know. Is it another resolution? Is it built into the, the next uh, budget? I'm not sure. So, um, you know, it's just money you're spending on litigation and not education. Um, you know, uh, you know, every, you know, just the bottom line here is every taxpayer is paying for this. So I just ask, you know, if you're, it's your position, at least drop the renewal part. You want to fight expansion, fine. A new way for the lottery, we can discuss, but please do that tomorrow. Drop the lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Herman, followed by Sabrina Stoffel. Jack Herman. Nope. How about uh, Sabrina Stoffel? I wanted to come up here and say, Leon, it's not okay for you to speak to please me that speak, way. Please speak so I can hear you. Leon, it is not okay for you to speak to me the way you spoke to me. It is not okay for you to yell over me while I am speaking. It is not okay for you to bully me or other people. Mia Narvano followed by Ariel Prevois and Charlotte Kielman. Mia. Um, Mia Naranjo, 1125 Maxwell Lane. Um, some kids have come to this school to learn the Spanish and, and sometimes people are breaking their dreams. Now, if the kid were to leave this school, I am sure they would be depressed. Now, if the school were to leave Hoboken and never be seen again, everyone that has worked hard and seen Ola come a very good place for the kids, they would be so sad, they would probably even leave Hoboken or New Jersey. Now, if you don't want any people to leave Hoboken or New Jersey, you need to give Ola a second chance and let Ola stay until eighth grade. Now, if Ola doesn't stay until eighth grade, you won't get the money to keep your jobs. And if you don't keep your jobs, you don't get homes. You don't get homes, no one's happy. Now, if you keep Ola happy and keep all the kids in the school happy, Everyone's happy, happy life, happy family, happy days. Kids in the school are trying to work hard and pass their grades. They, they do not want to leave the school. And there are some kids who haven't even been in the school for a year. Some kids, they just come to Ola in a random grade, like third, or they can go or they come into fifth. And like, within a year, they know all the Spanish that all their other fellow students know. Not everyone gets what they want. Ola wants what, they, what we want so we One can go to eighth honey. grade and stay in eighth grade. We don't want this to change. We don't want any other meanings. Thank you. Thank you. Ariel Prevois and Charlotte Kielman, followed by Christine Hoffman. Hello, my name is Ariel Prevois. I live um, in 1500 Hudson Street. And my name is Charlotte Kielman. I live on 212th Street. And and, and we go to Ola. <laughs> we are here for an explanation. Yeah. Why, do you, why are you suing the school? All our school has done is bring great education to Hoboken. I've heard that other kids in Hoboken want to go to our school. Now we realize that we are really lucky to go to Ola. So please don't end it at 6th. 
We love our school and we'll never let go. Besides, we're already on a roll. Okay, now we're gonna tell you the reasons why we like, love Ola and yeah. <laughs> My favorite part about Ola is learning computer programming called Scratch. Ola is my second home. I love Ola. I love Ola. It's definitely my second home. The teachers act like family. There's no negative, only positives. There's nothing anyone can ever do to tear this big family apart. We will stand together for anything that the world throws at us. I also want to thank Ola for all all of the help, because I won the Hoboken Spelling Bee this year. I've got to say, it's all because of them. Thank you so much, Ola. And if you, um, if you destroy Ola, then you will be destroying the students' hearts and, well, everything inside of them. <laughs> um, what, where would we go without each other? What would we do without each other? And most importantly, what would we feel without each other? Drop this lawsuit, por favor. Thank you. Christine Hoffman, followed by Brian Murray. Ms. McAllister, Christian Hoffman, by the way, 547 Bloomfield Street. Uh, Ms. McAllister, I just want to make something clear. What you said a few minutes ago was 100% wrong on the New Jersey Charter School law. I have it right here. The admission policy of the school is not, the, uh, the makeup of each school is not to be matched to the school district itself. It is to be matched with the community of school-aged children. That includes private schools. That includes it's charter not, schools. Great, you can not, see it. I have it here structure. for you. Okay, if you'd like to see it, I'll show it I've to you read later. It. Thank you, but I When read you it. get elected to the Board of Ed, you have to walk around, you have to politic, you have to speak to people, kiss babies, make promises, shake hands, whatever. All the people in this community you speak to. You don't say, hi, are you a parent of a public school per, uh, child or do you plan to be a parent of a public school child because I'm gonna talk to you because I need your vote because you're the only person that can vote for me, right? That's not correct. Everybody in this community votes for you and the reason is because everybody in this community is who you represent. You do not represent just the children in this traditional public school, okay? After you're elected, I imagine, as a public official, you get, sw you get sworn in and you probably have to say something to the effect of, you know, I swear to uphold my duties and responsibilities as a board member for the community of Hoboken and the people of Hoboken. And I assume that that happens. But the problem is you're not upholding that, that oath. You're not doing that. Because what you're saying to all of us is that you only represent a small population of the people here in Hoboken. You only represent the public, the traditional public school students by filing this lawsuit against Ola. That's what you're saying, okay? I have this poster here. And I think it probably looks very silly to you. It was homemade in a very short time period today. But it shows you the flow chart from your own paperwork. Who do you represent? It says, people of Hoboken, Mr. Derrico, as you said yes. earlier, they do not just represent the parents of the public school system. They no, represent Gary, the Gary. people of Hoboken. Wait, Gary, we got to. This is directly from your paperwork that you submitted to the New Jersey Department of Education. And you can find it on their website under the Hoboken Board of Ed section. Taxpayers here do not want this lawsuit. They want a good school system with choice. Taxpayers know that you represent everybody in the school system, and they know not to be short-sighted and to recognize the potential to the small businesses in town and the real estate prices in town if we have a good, diversified school system with choice for all parents. You need to all take a step back from your anger and your frustration, and quite frankly, for whatever reason, your match with the state and look at what's best for the people that you represent. Look at what's best for Hoboken. Do your job as we have asked you when we elected you. You represent all of us and we're Time's asking up, you to please. drop the lawsuit por favor. Brian Murray followed by Sandra Smith. 
Is Sandra still here? Well, uh, Mr. Murray, and then followed by <coughs> Sandra Smith. Excuse me. Brian Murray, 701 Monroe Street. Uh, first, I'd like to applaud all the kids that came out here tonight to speak and to get involved. Some of them are still here. It's after 10 o'clock, so apparently their education is important to them uh, and their families. Uh, secondly, I think that there's a lot of people here in the audience that uh, really can smell the BS that's been shoveled by this board and their representatives. They can talk about statistics all they want. They can kind of talk around what lawsuits are and what they're not. But all the people here on this side, they seem to know really what's going on because they actually do read the paperwork. Um, you know, uh, I bet you're wishing that you guys had voted to uh, have Ola as part of the public school about now. Um, so, you know, those chickens do come home to roost every once in a while. You know, I think that the thing here is that <coughs> this board acts like AOL, you know, not Google. You're, you're using a model where you, you're still trying to hold on to those dial-up subscribers and say, you know, we have this business model and it's going to work and if we can just get enough subscribers and if broadband doesn't come in, if we can rule that out, then, you know, we're going to be fine. The fact is that the world has changed. The model has changed. Your model has not changed. That's why we're having this budget issue this year and next year and the year after that. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people's jobs that are at stake. And it's your job to save their jobs. And you're not doing it. And that's unfortunate. And Ms. McAllister, I just want to read you uh, a little stat here that uh, there's a school that has 76% minority enrollment, 58% economically disadvantaged. They're ranked number 29 in the state, according to U.S. News and World Report. It's called Weehawken. Yeah. <laughs> so the next time that you find a way, Mr. Gold, Ms. McAllister, to talk about you know, economically disadvantaged minorities and you know, how that doesn't equate to the test scores, um, maybe you guys should be going up to Weehawken. It's only a short bus ride up the hill. Uh, while you still have the bus drivers, maybe take one of those buses up there and find out what they're doing right. And lastly, uh, you know, to all the engaged parents that are here tonight, um, there's a time to <coughs> make your voices heard. There's a continued effort. I suggest that you get involved in the Board of Ed. It's open to anyone, not just uh, folks with kids in the school district. And make your voices <coughs> heard on the board and get Excuse your me. wishes granted and, you know, maybe build a better model for all schools that will work together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Evans, followed by <coughs> Patricia Waiters. I called Gary and Rico, followed by Patricia Waiters. Are you Gary Evans or Gary and Rico? <laughs> No problem. I ain't going nowhere. I apologize. If I called your name incorrectly, I apologize. Do you have a, a lozenger? Sorry. Announce yourself, Mr. Enrico. I'm Gary Enrico. Thank you. I go back to what I said numerous times. Okay? I've been here probably too long, actually. But in 39 years, that I'm here, there is a divide in the city. And, it, and you know, and I love that the kids come up and they talk and all of that, but I didn't know that we were gonna have kids here because we would have brought our kids then too. All right, we would have bought, we would have bought the kids that are on the, aren't gonna have our bus drivers and I'm a grandfather of two beautiful granddaughters and you know what, I love kids. But I, I don't know if this is the place right now to do it. All right, I'm, I'm just giving you my opinion. Because we're talking about people's lives here. Gary, talk to him. We're talking about people's lives, their livelihood. All right? And I love kids. But the Board of Ed has, has a serious decision to make. All right? There has to be a reason 
and I've yet to get this, why we cannot have one school system with eight and a half million dollars coming back to the Board of Ed, and say there's 600 kids. Do the quick math, I don't know, say we need 40 teachers, 50 teachers. All right, we need 40 teachers, we hire them at 60,000, say 70,000. We'd have $2.8 million in salary, All right? We take, we keep a million for supplies and everything. We probably can give the taxpayers back about $4 million, $4 or $5 million. But there's something that we're not, either we're not doing something right, or the charter school people don't want to be with, in, in the schools that we have. Because our teachers are better, we're better trained, we have better facilities, but they choose to go on their own. The people on this board serve the public school community. That's who, the, the public elects you, but you represent the public school. Because if not, if it was the way this woman, I don't know your name, it was said about they work for all, then I think you should have a say in what goes on in a charter school. Then. If we're all one family, we should go to the meetings and we should start asking questions. You know, like they come here and they cross-examine everyone, and these, and these people are much smarter than I am. And they, they go over the budget. But I say this, why would a Board of Ed want to raise taxes? If they didn't need the money to run a system, why would they put that in the budget? The budget has to go past the county, past the state. If they was doing something that was wrong, I think someone would pick it up. I mean, am I, maybe I'm wrong in saying that. I think someone would pick it up. We've had disagreements over the years. We try to work with the Board of Education, and we are going to work with the Board of Education to get out of it. But I want someone to come up here and tell me why our schools are not good enough for their students. Forget the dual Thank language. You. I spoke one language Thank my you, whole Mr. life. Enrico. And I did great. Thank you, Gary. All right? Someone come up here one day and give me a reason. Thanks. Thank you. Patricia Waiters, followed by Greta Shun Gettens, I think. Patricia Waiters, and no, I'm not 1233 Park Avenue 3D, and I'm not giving my social security number. All right, let me just get a few things straight before I lose. I wanted to do dialogue tonight, but I'm not. I'm the person that's gonna come up here and speak on behalf of why a charter school, no charter school should come up here and say why they kids don't wanna be with our kids. My kids went to all the charter schools in Hoboken, and now I'm back in the public school. I want this board to answer a few quick questions when I leave. I want to stop seeing place the blame on the charter school. Let's place the blame on the board. Like this young lady jumped up tonight and said, I feel so sad and I'm sorry, but however, she was appointed by the board where there's no diversity, no Latino, no African American representation. Okay, so that's why I got emotional. However, 2006. 632 residents of Hoboken voted for me that live here. So now that's why you see my Ms. emotions Waiters, rise. Look at Excuse me, okay. I don't have to look at you. I'm addressing yes, you the board, right? Mr. Go. Stop trying to waste my time. We went through this already, okay? You're very rude and you're obnoxious and very disrespectful to, to be a, a professor. Stop board. it, because it don't work with Pat Waiters. And deduct my time from his ignorance. And like I said, I will continue. I'm sick of seeing diversity, diversity, and yes, tonight I am a little disappointed when Ms. Mitchell held up a paper and said, Africa, where'd I come from? Okay, I understand what your intentions is, and yes, I did read Sirline, and here go Mr. Gold's picture and his statement, okay? Like he said, I'm passionate about it because it's a civil rights issue, a government issue, and a moral issue. You show no moral respect nowhere, Mr. Gold, okay? But it was, he said, it wasn't intended to be race-based. Okay, exactly what we've seen all week, what's going on with the baseball team and the, the NFL. If you were bigot, it's gonna show. It's gonna show whether you're trying to hide it or not. You have segregated our city. It's very segregated here. It's sad that the regular school kids gotta feel like they're in a civil war. No, it's not. In, in a civil war with the charter school kids. And the truth heard it, don't set you free. Cause they will hear Pat Wade's voice all through Hoboken. You have segregated the system. You looked in these little kids' face tonight with no compassion and took a known disregard to their feelings. And you guys got kids in the school system. They pleaded with you, do not sue us. Do not sue us. But if they look at the sources here and see the mayor that endorsed y'all, she did nothing but sue. Sue, 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 because it's the taxpayer's money. Suing somebody is not the answer. You already clearly showed you segregate the city and you don't want to work with nobody. The public schools shouldn't be fighting the charter schools and vice versa. 
It's disgusting. And none of you can explain that. When you ran for the board, you went out to the charter school and tried to get votes, okay, and manipulate these parents. They don't have an idea what's going on. I do. I miss, I miss no community meetings. I go to every debate. In seven years, I ran for the board four times, and I know exactly what's going on. Dirty politics, cover up, no transparency, and it's still sad because all of these people are going to still lose their job. And our, our position is we should go over your head and go to the state Thank and have you. all of y'all step down, you, especially Mr. Mr. Race's goal. Thank you. Yes, I said it, and that's what it is. Greta Shun Gettens, followed by Roseanne Versace. Hi, my name is Greta Geddens, and I live at 87 Adams Street, and I'm a third grader at Ola, and today I'm going to say a few words about Ola, and I'm going to say it in the language that I've learned so well at Ola, which is Spanish. Ola es una escuela magnífica. Da educación a todos los estudiantes que van a Ola. Puede pero puedo preguntarles por qué están demandando a Ola? Y eso es el dinero de nosotros que estás usando para demar a nosotros. Si cierras ahora, ¿dónde quieres que yo voy? Porque yo no voy a una escuela que habla español cada dos semanas. Y puedo usar este tiempo para dar las gracias al Hoboken Board of Ed por darle, por dar hola el poder para abrir. Por favor, no cierres a mi escuela. Can I say that I wrote this with just from my knowledge of the three years that I've been go this the four years that I've been going to the school, and what I'm trying to say is you might have not understood me is where would you like me to go if you shut down Ola because I've been in a Spanish speaking school for four years and going to Wallace or somewhere like that and only having S Spanish for 20 minutes every two weeks would not be enough to keep my bilingual education running fluently. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, so um, despite my funny accent, I've actually been in this country for 15 years and I have very few choices in this town because I still don't have citizenship. But one of the few choices I did have, and I get very emotional about this, is to put my child's hat, name in a hat, to be pulled out. Um, I come from Europe and I understand how important it is in this day and age to speak more than one language. And it's not just teaching them more than one language, it's opening their minds to so many different things from such a young age. Um, and what I would really like people to see, the reason I actually bought my daughter, and I know that you're annoyed that we bought kids, and I'm terribly sorry, is this is her life. She has been in a bilingual school for four years, and if you are saying that that is not going to exist anymore, then what are the public schools other than Ola, which is a public school, going to do to encourage us to come back to the public school system. We should be working together and not fighting each other. Wasting public money to sue people when it could be used for wages is just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I've paid taxes for 15 years and I'm now paying taxes for you to sue us. When my daughter says, why is a public school suing a public school? I have no answer for her. And what I would just like to say in conclusion is that it's done amazingly, and the other charter schools are doing amazingly, and my friends' kids go to Wallace School, and they're doing amazingly. But think how amazing we could do if we all worked together. The charter schools do amazing fundraising. Wallace now does fundraising for its field day. We could all fundraise together, and what I would like to say in conclusion is that I know that we're never probably going to get a round of applause for being the model state school for dual language. I know that that's not something we're going to get from you, but I would just really like it if you would stop fighting us. Can you just stop fighting? It's so depressing when you do so well and you achieve such amazing things, and people still, like three days after you get awarded model school, you then get a lawsuit sent against you. 
It's just wrong. And I think you'll find that even public school people within the Wallace School have had their backs put out by that. They were all for you fighting us on different reasons, but when you start to pay lawyers with our public money to fight other public money, it's just wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Roseanne Versace, followed by Chris Munoz. <clears throat> Roseanne Versace, grade four teacher, Wallace School. Um, so many things kind of going on in my head. I'd just like to make a few clarifications, though. We do not get Spanish for 20 minutes a week. Um, we have full periods in the school, just, just in case that that was a, a, an issue. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I do take issue as a teacher and an, an educator in general with some of the comments that have been made to imply that the students are not being taught well. And that is what the implication was on many of the people that spoke, particularly Mr. Barrera, who was one of the first speakers. We work very hard. We put out a lot of our own money to supplement what we don't get in stipends and funds for uh, for various things for, for the students. And what is happening now in the city is very hurtful to me as a born and raised in Hoboken. And I did not go to the public schools. My parents chose to send my brother and sister and I to parochial school, but they paid for that. And it did not cost the district anything to do that. And I appreciate, I app you don't know what my parents' financial situation was, so you should not comment on it. And I am speaking, thank you. What I'd like to say, though, is what, is hap what happens with what's happening and why there's this divi division in the, in the district is because the parents are not leaving because they don't like Wallace or, or any of the other schools or they're not happy with the teachers or they're not happy with the education. They, they, they actually tell us that. So what, what's, what's the issue? Why do we need to have, I, I appreciate Ola has a separate curriculum, it's a dual language school. That's different, we don't offer that in, in, in the traditional public school. But the other charter schools, tell me what they're offering that we don't offer. We offer so much more and the whole, the whole theory and the whole reason behind the charter One schools was, was, to, was to offer something that parents couldn't get in a traditional public school. And I failed to see what that is. And so yes, we would love to have everybody come together. We would love to have these students. It's hurtful to the teachers when the kids say, well, you know, I'm not coming back next year. Why? I don't know. My mother's moving me out. My father's, you know, pulling, pulling me out. We want to keep these kids here. We want to keep every kid that we teach here. And that's just not happening. And I think that's something that people really need to re-examine. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Munoz, followed by Paul Freed. Wow, it's a long night, huh? All right, um, I just have a couple of points. Let me recap Name. a couple of things. Oh, I'm sorry. Christopher Munoz, Hoboken High School history teacher. Um, I just want to recap a couple of things. Someone from the left side of the room had made a comment about the good guys. Why are you coming after the good guys? Well, if they're the good guys, then I guess that means we're the bad guys. So if charter schools are the good guys, we're the bad guys. So if advocating for my students, my school district, and the Hoboken Public School employees makes me a bad guy, then so be it. I'll play that role. All right? Now, I noticed, what? I'm not, I'm not gonna address it. I'm not gonna address it, because I didn't yell out while anyone was speaking, thank you. All right, so the other thing is, I heard someone also say about the difference between, it takes $23,000 for the Hoboken Public Schools to educate a student, and we only do it for 11. You know, could it be that, you know, maybe the swanky fundraisers that Ola has where board members over there are paying $8,000 for cruises, maybe that's supplementing their income, I don't know. Or maybe could it be that they don't offer the same services that we do? All right, do they have special services? Do they have any special education children? Do they have transportation, facilities, school-based services like school psychologists or child study teams? These are the issues that I have. If you look at what the Hoboken Public School offers and Charter does, there's no comparison, okay? The other thing is I wanna address the issue of the board, members representing. I've heard members on this board say, I represent all the children of Hoboken. Someone over here said it. Let me get this, let, let me just break this down, okay? You have been elected to represent the children of the Hoboken Public Schools. 
You cannot make any changes in Ola, Elysian. You can only affect changes and vote on items here. You have been elected to represent the whole Hoboken Public School children. And I think people need to remember that. One minute. Um, I do have a question. One I don't minute. know. One minute? OK, we got to make this quick. We, we need a buzzer down here, a big clock or something. Um, you know, I want to address the issue of Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray, I, you know, every meeting I come here, and every meeting I hear this guy bashing the public schools. You know, maybe this isn't the forum for it. But I just want to bring out and point out that, you know, Mr. Murray runs a Hoboken to the Burbs little campaign there. He's bringing families to Chatham. So I'm wondering, would it be beneficial for him and for business to make it look like that there's nothing positive happening in Hoboken Public Schools, to make it more attractive for people to leave and go to Chatham? And Mr. Murray, you're not bringing people to Weehawken. You're bringing them to Chatham. All right? Um, I do have one question, though. Um, I know this would be uh, whatever. Can we petition the state to go over the 2% cap? Is that something I can get answered now, or can I just? No, well, we answer it at the end. Okay, you answer it at the end? Okay, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Freed, followed by Deidre Wall. Hi, my name is Paul Freed. I live at 230 Madison Street. Uh, just to put it in perspective, you know, I'm hearing numbers 21,000, 23,000, 11,000. Uh, Rutgers in-state tuition is 13.5. Uh, you know, there was a comment about why we wouldn't want to use the public schools, and I just pulled this up off localschooldirectory.com, and, and here's where Hoboken's public schools rank. Elementary schools rank 345 out of 527 cities. Middle schools rank 316th out of 435. High schools rank 239 out of 285. That, that's why I wouldn't want to use the public schools. I, I can't speak for anybody else over here. Uh, the, so my daughter, my daughter goes to Ola. She's in fourth grade. She's been there for three years. Uh, and she's enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, she's getting a great education and developing well socially. Uh, she, she's also a Puerto Rican Jew, so I, I, I don't understand the whole discrimination thing. But uh, so one of the things that I, I try to instill in my children almost daily is to be accountable for their actions, right or wrong, and to realize that there's consequences for those actions. The fact is that historically the Board of Education in Hoboken has done less than a stellar job with the public schools and, and, and should stop pointing the finger elsewhere and accept responsibility for their actions. And one of the consequences of failing public schools are charter schools. You know, when I walk up the avenue now, go through parks, there's kids all over the place, strollers all over. I hear things like, I hear terms like the, the mommy mafia, stroller city, right? You know what, it, it, it wasn't that long ago, families fled Hoboken to the suburbs for a, a, a public school education, right? The, the trend now seems to have switched back a few years back, ironically enough, when, when charter schools emerged. I, I, I don't know that that's coincidence. My daughter's not going back to Ola next year because we, we decided to put, minute, her, put her into the Hudson School. But, but I, want to thank, I want to thank the founders of Ola and the parents who dedicate themselves to the school for helping my child get into the Hudson School. It wasn't an easy decision for our family to make, but with all the uncertainty around Ola these days, I, I needed to know that my daughter's got a place to go as long as she wants it. So I'm here to let you know that regardless of the board's position and the fate of Ola, the public school system in Hoboken is not an option for a lot of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deidre Wall, followed by Mark Petroselli. Um, hello, good evening. Uh, Deirdre Wall, 4th and Madison Street. Um, I'm the parent of a child in the seventh grade at Hoboken Junior Senior High. It is our family's eighth year in the Hoboken Public School District, where we began at Wallace School, a district about which I'm both proud of and passionate about. I know tonight is a very difficult night for the board as you face painful budget decisions, including layoffs of staff, and in the face of flat aid, and with the incredible rise in charter school expenses from $4 million in 2010 to $8.2 million this upcoming year. The district has clearly reached a budget tipping point. However, it is a testament to your dedication and management skills that in the last few years you have not only absorbed this incredible growth in expenses, 
um, but you have also maintained and improved the quality of the education in the public schools, and I thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. As a district parent, I support the board's appeal of the state's decision to expand and renew OLA. Would OLA do anything different if the situation were reversed? No. If OLA was appealing, they too would be spending taxpayer dollars as all the districts are funded by the taxpayer. There is a most curious unwillingness to recognize that the board has a duty, this board has a duty to its students, just as OLA has a duty to its students. Asking our board to step aside and not appeal is an unacceptable double standard in my opinion. It is unfortunate that the state sets up this adversarial situation in funding between the school districts and that state policies mean that the expansion of OLA will have a negative impact on my school district. However, it is equally unfortunate that certain political leaders decided to insert themselves into this adversarial process by taking one side and supporting OLA students over the Hoboken Public School District students. Why any elected official at the state or city level concluded that the negative impact to our school district was in any way acceptable is completely One beyond, my, beyond my comprehension, as is their further request to that our district refrain from appealing the state's decision. Instead of taking a leadership role and advocating for all of the students in all of the school districts, certain elected officials are promoting the divide between parents and neighbors in our community. It is a very sad day when our elected leaders, for all intents and purposes, turn their backs on the largest school district, the district with the greatest percentage of free and reduced lunch and at-risk students. I commend the board for continuing to vigorously advocate and defend the interests of our district students at all times and in all situations. Thank you. Mark, Mark Petroselli, followed by Alex Neary. What was that? Hello, Mark Petroselli, 1240 Park Avenue. So uh, most of what I wanted to say has been uh, covered, but um, I would <laughs> like to just clarify comments for any members of faculty for, from any of the public schools here. Um, things have been said about the performance of Hoboken High School, some of the, the public schools, and. The facts, speak for them, the facts speak for themselves, as uh, one of the gentlemen said, with the statistics just showing uh, less than stellar performance. But please, please understand that any blame for this, uh, I think, is laid squarely at the feet of this board. Certainly not for any educators who dedicate their careers, uh, their lives, to a relatively thankless job that is oh so important to the community for a minimal amount of time. My mother was a teacher. I taught for a while. Uh, did not pursue getting certified license because I didn't have the courage to dedicate my life to something that would be so difficult uh, with a lack of recognition. So please understand that, anyone to whom this applies in this room. Um, let's talk about Hoboken High School. My children do go to Ola. What I would love would be for my children to go to Hoboken High School several years from now. Uh, if they were high school age right now, it would not happen. So what I'm doing is I'm imploring you, the board, to act wisely, take some of the wonderful things that you could learn from the experience at OLA, some of the good things in the business world is called best practices, apply it as you would know better than I would, whatever kind of resource will support the faculty that we've heard that we've heard on this side of the room that will bring savings uh, that will help people like these bus drivers keep their jobs one minute um, what I would ask is that rather than fighting a what I'll use the term success story uh, something that's going very very well please take what you can try to integrate it into your system um, try to learn from it who knows what the future holds? There were some great suggestions. If you're short on money, maybe use some of the resources when it comes to available space to try and bring in some extra money and help the charter schools who are, who are dying for a little bit of extra space. Um, I think there's a lot of good that can come from this. And when I hear things like uh, you don't represent um, the, the charter schools, the fact that the money is a large portion of the funding that comes into the charter schools goes through your hands. So in reality, yes, you do, you do control it. So um, 
I'll just ask you to please consider this and uh, do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Neary, followed by Jake Saperstein. Hi, good evening. Sorry if I'm a little punchy right now. I spent the whole day in jury duty. Um, oh, we'll need your name and address, though. Oh, please. Alex Neary, 100 Bloomfield Street. Um, I had stuff written down, but pretty much everybody ahead of me said what they needed to say and what I was going to say. But all of us have been in Hoboken in one way or another for the past, like, 20 years. In the past 25 years, you've seen such a tremendous growth in Hoboken. It's one of the best up-and-coming cities in the U.S. And you talk, we talk about people having to leave because they're worried about, like, the high school grades and the high school's test scores. You know, work, my idea is work with the charter schools, work with the public schools, get the best of both worlds, combine our resources so we're not fighting over resources. Because I'd love to stay here too. But if I have to, I'm gonna move elsewhere. I mean, I love this town, I love this city, as many other people do. And that's why we fight so hard. And that's why these people fight so hard. We just need to come up with a new way. We need to diversify, we need to, you know, change the paradigm. The paradigm has changed already. These are the future of schools all over the nation. If we can integrate that, there's open space in these public schools. If we can leverage some of that, you know, we're saving, find savings there. Um, that's all I really have because I'm a little punchy now and everybody else said what I was going to say. So okay. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Jake Saperstein followed by Jose Batilla. Jake Saperstein, 463 First Street. Before I get into my script here, I, I just have some notes I wanted to go through. The first is a question for Dr. Toback. You had mentioned um, in your comments in response to some of the questions that came up that you didn't have any intention to close down OLA. Um, and, and you also have expressed that in the past in, in meetings uh, in these forums as well as in an email that I have from you here. It says the letter, referring to your letter late last year, does not indicate any interest in shutting down OLA. So please, if you can't answer now, you can hopefully answer the question later. Why is the word renew in your petition? Why isn't this just about expanding? And why is the word renew in the petition if this is not what you intend? Um, they'll answer when everybody speaks. Please. Sure. Dr. Gold. Interesting, your discussions about segregation and your recent articles, I find it mind-boggling that you started an open forum discussion to the community with a point about how we have different groups in the room. That is divisive. That is unnecessary. Now to my script. Thank you uh, to the board uh, to, for the chance to speak. I appreciate your effort. None of us question your effort and your passion for helping the community. That all said, I, I do question your approach to improve, improving your system. Budgeting issues are an important factor in any business. We all get that. But your decision to favor an excessive focus on numbers, especially when we're talking about a relatively small amount of your overall budget, at the cost of suppressing a unique and innovative educational program continuing, and continuing to its natural endpoint, is simply not going One to make minute. any significant improvements for education in your district. Further, and most important, getting in the way of innovative programs and educational choice will ultimately blow your chances of improving education for all in Hoboken. The idea here is to have the fruits of educational choice percolate into the core public district. Dr. Toback, your five sentence letter to me on March 3rd, the last of these five sentences, the decision for the expansion of OLA is in the hands of the Commissioner of Education, dot, 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 not me. That was on March 3rd, a couple days before we got word of our expansion. The last name of the commissioner at that time was Surf. Please, stop getting in our children's way. Let our community thrive. Let us stay the course with this unique dual language program. Think bigger, think more, think out of the box, drop the lawsuit, por Thank favor. You. Thank you, Mr. Sapostein. Jose Batilla, followed by Barbara Martinez. 
Thank you. Jose Vatia, B A T, and a couple other. Next. Pretty much gone. Barbara Martinez. Gone. Next. Lynn Dansker. Dina Merdinian. Kathleen Kielman. Followed by Fiona Sargent. I think a lot of what I was, um, oh, Kathleen Kielman, 212th Street. I think a lot of what I was going to talk about was already spoken about. Um, I just want to reiterate that Dr. Toback on uh, page two of the December 10th letter to the Commission SURF, I fully support OLA with its currently approved configuration as a K-6 dual language school. And then just four months later on 10th of April 2014, asking for the renewal to be put on hold to the, the process, the reassess the granting of the renewal and a remedi remedial plan um, within the current grades um, to be implemented before um, the expansion was granted. So that clearly shows that um, okay. renewal is a factor. And I would just reiterate what um, Aaron said, that if there's any way to either drop the lawsuit or to reassess what you submitted and drop the renewal um, from the petition, um, I think that would be uh, a, a good way forward. Um, secondly, I've heard a lot of divisiveness today. And it is worrying as a community because we are all Hobo Hoboken residents. A lot of us have children in the school. Um, we, my daughter attended Brand, and we love the teachers at Brand, and we respect every one of those teachers and people that support education throughout this whole community. So I think that's, despite what we're saying, we, we have a lot of respect for everyone. But there's something that I think this dialogue is good in some ways because it because it now there's a big forum and there's a lot of passionate people here we need to take that passion and direct it into something that's very productive for all of us and we need to change the course of the dialogue that's happening in this town and not let it get, get it as divisive or more divisive and potentially dropping that lawsuit or revising that lawsuit I think would go a long way to restoring some of the credibility of the board um, and make a lot of people feel like there is a way forward in this town. Um, we need common ground instead of a battleground. We need a relationship focused on problem solving instead of a relationship focused on posturing. We need transparency and accountability to all public schools. There is something called a district charter collaboration compact. Um, that the, uh, the Gates Foundation has been developing. There are about nine schools across the country that have signed a collaboration compact between the district and the charter schools. And I would suggest that as part of that compact, it's a compact to work together to share best practices and provide all children in our community with a public school education that prepares them with skills and knowledge to succeed in college and the workforce and public school children, I'm talking about charters and the traditional public schools. Um, we need families to have real choice among a variety of unique schools. And Ola, Elysian, and Hoboken Charter do provide something um, different than the traditional Thank public schools provide. You. And it is a choice. Thank so you very much. please drop the lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have to change tapes. Next person. Next person is Fiona Sargent, followed by Jen Sargent. Oh, they went, they went home. So, Kerry Rubin. Oh, that's Jen Sargent. Oh, throw it out. Jen Sargent, 518 Grand Street. Here we are again. <laughs> I had hoped that the next time we met, we'd be talking about common goals within the district instead of <clears throat> once again fighting for our survival. I believe strongly in public education, and that is why almost six years ago, I, together with the other OLA founders, proposed the development of a dual language program within the Hoboken Public Schools. I believe that when you bring diverse groups of people together with a common goal, everyone benefits, from the individual to the community as a whole. That is why five years ago, when the district rejected our proposal, we submitted a charter application to the Department of Education. We knew that as a free public school, a charter school would provide for the greatest access to the broadest cross-section of our community. 
culturally, academically, socioeconomically, and linguistically, with no financial or other barriers to admission. Ola is a public school, and our students deserve to be funded just as the other public school students in our district. I believe that parents should be able to choose the right model of education for their children and for their families, and that we're incredibly fortunate as a community to be able to provide such a range of choices. That is why, as a leader of Ola, I have never disparaged any other school in our district, and we have consistently and consciously chosen to rise above the negativity that has been directed at, towards us as a school, largely from members of this board, and the divisiveness of the public rhetoric. I believe in honesty and transparency. That is why I take great offense to the claims made by the superintendent and some members of this board that there is no real lawsuit against Ola, and that this non-lawsuit only seeks to challenge our expansion and not our renewal. This is most certainly false on both counts, and you cannot have it both ways. On April 14th, we received a notice of appeal from the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Division in which Ola is named as a respondent, as in the Hoboken Board of Education versus Hoboken Dual Language Charter School, as it is stated in the suit. We have subsequently received the petition that names Ola as a respondent as well. That means that Ola is obligated One by minute. law to enter into a legal process that begins with the time frame of 20 days to submit a legal response to each challenge, even though we are not the decision makers in this case, and there is nothing that Ola has the power to do in order to satisfy the board's wishes, even if we wanted to. It is wasteful and gratuitous to even name us in the lawsuit. I can only presume that the board wishes to drain us financially since we do not have the resources the district does for a protracted legal battle. Dr. Tobek is playing with semantics when he says that this is not a, a suit. The petitioner demands the following relief. The March 25th renewal and expansion of OLA be set aside. The Commissioner of Education should reassess granting the renewal and expansion in accordance with New Jersey statutes. Make no mistake, we're fighting for our very existence. I believe that schools must be held accountable, but once the school has proven itself, as, most, as OLA most certainly has, both in the eyes of its parents and the Department of Education, that it should be permitted to flourish and not actively hindered. That is why, as a founder, administrator, parent, community member, and taxpayer, I'm outraged by the audacity and irresponsibility of the board's actions. Tying our expansion to cuts in the district is misleading, divisive, and untrue. Our impact for this coming school year, for the budget that you passed and that we've been discussing tonight, our impact is negligible. You have known for five years that we'd be adding a 44 students to kindergarten this year, okay. and for the Since past the year, the that our 18 fifth graders would be moving up to sixth grade. 18 students. It is a drop in the bucket. Our entire budget of $3 million is a drop in the bucket of your total budget and the incremental expansion to next year is so tiny that it's not even worth discussing. Thank 18 you. students. You're Thank spending you. a Sergeant, great deal uh, of money over, to challenge what please, is considered. You've gone over the three minutes. We've given you five. Would you please wrap it up? The Board of Education has already exercised its right to submit a letter in opposition to our renewal and expansion. It was considered and rejected. We have been approved by the Department of Education. Please drop the lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you. Kerry uh, Rubin, followed by that query, Connors. But a uh, Kerry Rubin. Seeing none. That's Kiri Connors. Hello, my name is Dakri Connors, and I live at 11th and Willow. Um, I just I had a lot of things that I wanted to say. A lot of people have um, spoken about a lot of different things, and um, now I just kind of feel like it's just sad. I mean, every time I hear about politics in Hoboken, it just makes me really sad. I grew up in DC, I grew up in Maryland, being around politics, and I find a lot of times politics clouds people's judgment about what is the right thing to do. And it's really sad when the politics comes down to the education of children. Children, for goodness sake. Like, I, I just, I, I, it is mind boggling why this is still coming up as an issue, and I get it. Like, you know, if you divide the city, like public schools, um, you know, or the traditional public schools between charter schools, I mean, they're all schools. They all educate children. I mean, it's not private school. You're not paying to like send your kids to private school. They're, they're all in the public school system. We're all taxpayers. We pay taxes in this town. And I don't understand why 
I, I just feel like, and I know you said it's not scapegoating, but it really, uh, on the outside, it sounds like scapegoating. And I get it. Like, if there's not enough money in the budget and they got to cut jobs, it's a business. You're running a business. And if you have to cut jobs, people's jobs, you have to answer to that. And so, you know, we've got to find some place where the money's going to come from. I still, I'm, in listening to all of these things, I still have not received an answer about the, the funds. Like, why, um, you know, why there is this, why getting rid of Ola is going to give people their jobs back. That, that's what I, I haven't heard that. Um, I still don't understand that. I don't understand how, you know, getting the people their jobs back is going to come by closing a school. I don't understand how you're going to, how you're going to educate my children if they don't go to Ola. If you close Ola down and my children get pushed back in, you say, oh, that's a small cost. Well, if it's a small cost, then why, are, why is there a lawsuit not to expand? Is it because in two years you won't, you don't know how to handle the money? I, I, I just, it, I still don't understand it. And so for those reasons and, and more, because I mean, I live here, my children live here, and it is a community. It's a loving, wonderful community that Ola has created. And I, for those reasons and more, I just am imploring you to please just drop the lawsuit or change it to, you know, not include the renewal, um, just so that we can all work together and it's not so divisive. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Shore, followed by Nancy Pincus. <clears throat> I'm Mark Shore. I live at 514 Garden Street. I have a son in Ola, but uh, I'm not going to basically speak about Ola. Uh, I wasn't planning to speak tonight, and I can apologize to the Ola families, not to add to things that have been said, but I think people spoke very well uh, and covered a lot of ground. So I hope I can allow myself to speak about something else, which I didn't expect to be concerned about. But I found myself very upset about the apparent decision to uh, let go of the jobs of the transportation uh, people uh, serving the school system. And I appreciate that I don't personally uh, know these people, and I'd like to explain my response. Uh, first of all, I think, I, and I appreciate, I know very little about the difficulty that you must have faced in uh, the kinds of choices that you have to make, and the, the numbers and the realities that you have to deal with, and I take you at your word that you're very upset about the situation as well, but it seems to me to be, to speak perhaps to a mistaken situation we're all in, because if the response to the current budget crisis is to hurt the services that go to children in the public school, and if what I'm, I really listened to what you were saying, it sounds like this is the beginning of a, a avalanche, a real budgetary crisis, which is only going to grow. And if the response to that is to cut people who are valuable in the system, or even to cut, if, it, if it's OLA, to, to, to reserve those funds, what next? And if it gets larger, who's going to be cut then? And what's going to be left for the children? And I'm going to say something that may sound weird, but I, I was also upset at the idea that you're taking care of the taxpayers by trying to keep the taxes down. Now, I'm going to not really, really upset people by saying this, but I think there's a public trust. And I think that we, as a Hoboken community, should be taking care of the school system. And we should be fighting the state if the state's wrong not to be releasing funds to the school. And we should be making up the difference so that there can be bus drivers. I'm really opposed, I'm very angry that, that you're, you're firing people who are valuable for the system. And it really is a problem to privatize. I do think that as well. And I, I don't have time to go into my opinions about that. But I, I would pay as a taxpayer to keep the bus drivers. And I think that you have a responsibility, I'm sorry to go on just for 
20 seconds more. You have to be courageous. You have, if you have this kind of problem and it's gonna get worse next year and the year after that and the year after that, you need to go to the Hoboken community and say, you have to take care of us. It ha you have to come to us. Thank you, Mr. Scher. Okay. Nancy Pinkus, followed by Virginia Einstein. Everybody Hello. gets three minutes, Chris. Hello, Nancy Pincus, 36 Willow Terrace. Um, I would just like to thank that parent who just spoke because um, I'm very impressed that, um, I'm very impressed that he, he, he's genuinely concerned about the, uh, the well-being of our public school system, even though the Hoboken District Schools, even though he's you know, here on the other side of the aisle tonight. So I, 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 I do appreciate that. Um, it's past my bedtime. I, I just, I, I'll be quick. I just wanted to thank um, all of you. I want to thank the school board for taking what is a very unpopular position in this room because you, you are the last line of defense for the many, many children who are not represented here tonight who don't have our politicians advocating to keep money in the classroom. And, you know, as I look around and I'm, you know, the children who showed, who came out tonight are adorable and wonderful. Um, it just, it just made me sad, you know, to see these, to know that these children um, are, are terrified and have been told that they are losing their school and that they're, they came out tonight to beg you guys to keep their school open. I think it was really um, very sad to do that. I know that if, um, you know, my daughter uh, would be equally uh, distraught to find out or to be told by me that her school was closing. Um, she was distraught when she heard about the faculty being laid off. Um, she was distraught when she heard f kids in school talking about the crap they read on Patch about, you know, how uh, Hoboken uh, High School is the ninth most dangerous school in, in the state of New Jersey. Um, my daughter is really used to hearing um, our schools bashed, um, but she loves it. She loves Wallace. One minute. Um, yeah, I know I'm rambling because it's past my bedtime. But anyway, um, the children were adorable. I'm just very sad that um, I, I, I do believe it was wrong to, um, to scare them because I know that there's really no, that our board does not want to see Ola closed. Um, our board supports, you don't believe it, but we support the school up to the sixth grade. And um, I don't know why children are being told that their school is closing, and I don't know why, you know, they had to be brought here, and I just feel sad. Thank you, Ms. Pincus. Okay. Thank you. We're losing a cameraman now, right? Okay, go. Okay. Oh, he's just fun. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Will. Virginia Einstein, followed by Liz Mulholland. Hi again, everyone. I'm the gentleman that spoke earlier um, with the four school districts in hand comparing them. I'm going to move quickly because a lot of things have been said and I've written down a lot of crazy notes. And um, I guess my first one is that we're talking about a $48 tax increase. Is that correct? Like on average of 56, I think was the average tax increase in your slideshow presentation, 56 is that over the year? Or are we talking about a cup of Starbucks a month to save these people's jobs? I mean, is that what we're talking about? Because if, if it is, I, I can't even imagine while we're here. I, it, that is criminal, really. Um, and I didn't even come here to talk about these, these people and, and hearing your stories and is in incredibly moving and I am sorry and no matter what side of the aisle you're on tonight the 60 or so people that stayed here I thank every single one of you I thank every single one of the board for staying I know this is long um, 
we had a gentleman, Gary, I'm not sure what his last name was, he was very passionate, and he came up and he said that the Hoboken Public Schools facilities are better and their teachers are better, and I take issue with that because two of our charter schools um, rent their facilities from you. And I think to say that your facilities are better is just, frankly, asinine. And then um, you say that it's hurtful for the, you know, to the teachers for the students to come and say, and, I, and it is, I know that that is, I can imagine that a teacher hearing that I'm not coming back next year from a student is hurtful. I know that all of my daughter's public school teachers loved her very much, and I also know that one of her, an award-winning teacher, encouraged us to go and take this opportunity at Ola. Did not discourage, she encouraged us to take a chance on something that was different. And I don't want our differences on either side of the aisle to cost anyone, one person, 10 people, 20 people their jobs. And again, if this is if we're talking about an average $56 tax increase across the board, I, I mean, pardon my friends, I think it's that we're here. I, I would buy, I'd, I'll forego my coffee to keep everyone here's jobs. And I think that anyone that you ask put in those terms would. Um, I actually have to go because my husband has to go to work in 45 minutes. So um, thank you everybody for staying. I, can't, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you, Ms. Liz Mulholland, followed by Teresa Minatillo. <laughs> Hi, Liz Mulholland, local taxpayer. Um, I heard a lot of confusion and inaccurate comments made, and unfortunately, it always ends up with bashing of the local public schools. Um, there's a misunderstanding of how funding works in the state of New Jersey, and it's very unfortunate that local school districts throughout the country are being blamed for the financial issues that are being thrust upon the local districts. In the state of New Jersey, they have shortchanged the local public school districts this year for the upcoming budget by $1 billion. It's $1 billion that local taxpayers are going to have to make up for their costs. School districts are impeded by 2% caps. They are forced to stay under a 2% cap or used bank cap. This is the state's problem. This is the state's process. This is the state's issue. Just as this charter school situation is the state's issue. Only a state can create such an insane process that nobody can figure out with clarity immediately how per pupil costs are designed. It is absolutely unreal. And then what happens? Just what happens in Hoboken happens throughout every district in every state that is dealing with new charter school issues coming in. It doesn't have to be this way. It absolutely does not. It can be easy. And even with this convoluted process they put in place, they don't follow. The state does not follow the process that they laid out. There are four issues that were listed inside this petition to the commissioner. This is not a lawsuit that is sitting in front of a judge. With, it is petitioning the commissioner to please follow the process as set down by state statute. That's clearly what it says. It is sent to the commissioner of education and it says the Hoboken Board of Education requests One minute. Sorry, that you follow your process because you only answered, because first of all, the person who was supposed to sign the application didn't even sign the application. Somebody who was not authorized for this school to sign this application approved it. That's not within the statute. Furthermore, they're asking for two more things, which I fully support. They're asking the state to help with the funding issues, and they're asking the state to help with the enrollment issues. This is a nightmare. We can all agree that the funding issues are a disaster. So in closing, what I want to say is I think that this, these disagreements that are going on in the community are purely the state's fault. This is not the district's fault. The district is doing exactly what it should be doing for the local taxpayers. They're asking the state to help offset the cost that they are 
pushing onto the district while they're simultaneously cutting state funding to the districts, which ultimately causes the taxpayers to pay more. And yes, we have 3,000 kids in public schools. Thank, thank you. Sorry, unfortunately, um, Oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. I was hoping that's good. All right. Well, anyway, I just up. want to thank you so much. And thank please, you. I hope that thank the whole you. community understands this lies with the state. Thank you. Teresa Minatulo. <coughs> when the meeting first name, opened. Name and address, please. Oh, sorry. Teresa Minatulo, uh, Bloomfield Street, Hoboken. And lift the microphone. Can you hear me? Uh, the first representative um, for Ola got up, and the first thing that I heard was him disparage our district. He insulted the board and our students. And I was bracing myself for a long night of the same. And parent after parent, and also some of the children came up, and they made it very clear that our district wasn't good enough for them. The history of Ola is greatly exaggerated, and I didn't plan on speaking until Jen Sargent got up and started to speak about the history of Ola. She said that Ola could have, been part of the prog could have been part of the programs offered here in this district school. Um, but that's just not true. What's true is that there wasn't any money to fund the implementation of the Ola Do Language program as part of this district. That was the truth. That same year, that same budget year that Ola would have taken effect, 14 teachers lost their jobs. So there wasn't any money to fund the program. That is the truth, and that is what happened. And Jen says that she doesn't disparage our district, and that she would never. But sitting on Ola's board is a former disgruntled employee of our district, and he spends an, an enormous amount of time on his blog disparaging, criticizing, turning facts inside out, upside down, to do whatever he can to disparage the progress that our district has made. I brought it to ten, Jen's attention. I brought it to some of my friends who are OLA parents. Two months ago, I went to an OLA meeting, and I brought it to Anthony Petrosino's attention. I told him what he was doing was wrong. I told him I thought it was unethical that he would use his blog to try and destroy our district. Jen sat there. So did the rest of the board members. They heard what I said. I said it's wrong for a board member to disparage another district in the same city. That it's hurtful and harmful to the students, to the parents, to our hard work working teachers and a dedicated board and superintendent. At last month's OLA board meeting, Anthony Petrosino had his tenure renewed. You can't have it both ways, Jen, that's what you just said. You can't have it both ways. And you're right, you can't come here and allow your parents, your students, yourself to disparage and diminish the progress that our district has made and then sit there and say, let's be friends and let's work together. You've got to show more. And you can start by also removing the funding formula that is incorrect by, on your website. It perpetuates lies, it makes your parents not understand and the rest of the community not understand the facts as are stated. And it would be very helpful if you reined in your board members, if you talk to your parents. We are a community, okay? Thank We're you. a community of parents and children. We should all respect ourselves. Our district deserves Thank it. You. Thank you to my board. Thank you to my superintendent. Thank I think you, you're doing Ms. a fantastic job. That was the last speaker. Yes. Uh, I can't make a motion to close the meeting. Does anyone want to say anything? Um, motion to close? Yes, I think okay, right. please. Um, no, oh. okay, you want to go down? No, 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 no. I thought we were motioning. Oh, um, well, I, I kind of live what Teresa had said that when Ola first opened um, in 2005, we were we were told that there was no impact. I think a lot of people like to make this out to be some kind of big battle between Ola and the public schools. And in 2009, we were told that the funding came from the state. And as Teresa pointed out, Jennifer still has that on her website. It's, it, it is very confusing because the, the funding doesn't come from the state. It clearly comes from the tax levy, money that would be used by our children. So there, there is kind of that tension there. And I, I think it's kind of interesting that there are these calls for coming together and it, here and online. There's lots of calls. But what I think is interesting is that it starts with 
our appeal. And I, I'd be kind of curious to go back to the beginning of the application. Now, certainly um, the, the administration of OLA and the board members knew that there would be some impact, minimal they feel, not so minimal I feel, to the application going forward. I would have liked to have seen some outreach before then, have one administrator call up the other administrator and say, look, we would like to go to eighth grade. How would that impact you? How would that impact your families? How would that impact your students? So I, I didn't see that. I see it now. I sort of feel that it, the kind of call to come together is now uh, get out of our way and let us do it. The impact to you is minimal. And, and I, I don't feel that that's right. I feel that um, I, I am elected to represent the students here. And if I were to step aside and not protect the students' interests in this district, they would have no representation. Your district would then have two boards fighting for it, and our kids would have none, and that will never happen for me. I was elected to represent these children and then this staff, and that's what I will do. Um, but I, I think there, I still sense this confusion that I kind of bring up a lot all the time. We are four districts, four districts. Think about that, in Hoboken, four districts. I, I mean, that sh chart may have been shocking to people, but I think we have to address that. You know, it's no different than, um, you know, Bayonne and Weehawk and everybody sharing services. I mean, that might work out, but the savings, because the way the state sets up the funds, the savings may be to the charter schools, but it's just gonna end up costing us money too. The funding is so complex. So I think that, I think there are ways that maybe we can get together. I think I said this last time you were here, we need to tone the rhetoric down a little bit. I mean, I think when you come to our gym, our home, and, and, and even the little children say, well, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move. I mean, that's, it's hard, you know, I'm a parent here. Our parents are here too. So I think if we want to all get along, it has to kind of come from both sides. I think it has to be a little bit of give and take on both sides. But in this crazy way that the state has set this up, in this dynamic, I work for these students. And that's just, that's how it is. And I hope that we can get together, but I will never step aside and abandon these students, ever. Thank you. I just want to say something, Mr. Chair. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, I just want to say, uh, Liz Mahalan, you're absolutely right. The problem does lie in, in Trenton. That's where it is. And what we need, they need to fund the charter schools better. They really do. They are a public school and they need to be funded by the state. And, and that would solve a lot of problems. Unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't work out that way. They mandated that it has to come from us and they are a public school. Um, that being said, I would encourage everybody, every member of the community, reach out to our legislators, email, call them, because believe it or not, they don't understand the issues here. They really don't. And you need to reach out to them and, and, and make them know what's going on and petition them to lobby with the Department of Education and get something done here, the funding. That's all I have to say. And I wish you all a happy Mother's Day, all your moms. You. And you daddy moms, too. Okay. Motion to close? Second. Aye. 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 Aye.